Today is the IPFA Foundation Day. In 2016, the government took this initiative and uh, we had really a great success on how we are managing this awareness campaigns. And uh, we are particularly uh, delighted that the new Joint Secretary from Ministry of Corporate Affairs, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the IPFA, Investor Education uh, Protection Authority, Fund Authority, uh, the authority which runs these funds and reaches out to people on awareness. So it is uh, m my privilege to welcome uh, all panelists. I'll request to come on the dais. Uh, so please come, madam. Madam Michaela, uh, it's a privilege to have you here at NCAR. I think it's your first visit here. Uh, so please have your seat. Uh, particularly, please all of you also come in. So uh, let me introduce others here on the panel also. Uh, Mr. Sumit Rani uh, uh, is here. Uh, we also have uh, Rakesh, Mr. Rakesh, who is a member of IPFA. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tushar is there. And uh, <laughs> So uh, we have MR Shrikant from Reserve Bank of India also joining us. He will be actually uh, making a presentation on uh, financial literacy. Uh, so Reserve Bank is sort of a knowledge partner for us and is also a member of IPFA uh, uh, among the regulators. So uh, uh, welcome to him also. Okay. Uh, so, uh, without much ado, uh, I mean, uh, let's get, we have a tight schedule for the full day and uh, uh, there are a lot of events here. Uh, so, without any further wastage of time, uh, I would uh, first request uh, Mr. Rakesh then to say a few words. Mr. Rakesh. Oh, okay. Let's first do the lighting of lamp. Uh, I think uh, then we can start the proceedings. Uh, so I'll request Madam to come forward. Please. Others can also join.
May I now request uh, Mr. Rakesh to say a few words, and then we will have a keynote address from uh, the CEO. Good morning to all dignitaries on the dais and the participants. At the outset, I would like to thank Team IEPF to have who has given me the opportunity to speak and give this special address. As has been stated earlier, IEPFA was set up on 7th of September 2016. It's now around six years old, baby. It was set up to make refunds of shares, unclaimed dividends, matured deposits, debentures accepted to investors, and promote awareness among investors. Awareness against frauds, Ponzi schemes, etc., so that investors are conscious that their money, hard-earned money, is not lost. I became member of the authority in 2020 for three years. Our role had been to oversee and support the working of IPFA, give an independent view. In the last two years, we got tremendous support from the team IPFA, and in spite of COVID, the team has done wonderful work. But whenever I say the past has been wonderful, there's always scope of, scope of improvement. So I will just say that since there's a scope of improvement, we are working continuously with the team to ensure that there's a superior processing of claims. The programs are organized well for investor awareness. And we have also noticed that there are various agencies which are giving programs for investor awareness. It has been the endeavor of IEPFA to consolidate and put you know, these awareness programs on common platform so that one is not competing with each other, rather one is supplementing each other. It's also our desire that we create some connect with the investors. Some efforts have already been done by IPFA in connecting with the investors and potential investors whose stocks, dividends, or shares are locked with the authority. In next session, uh, the executives of IPFA will be talking about their various initiatives which they have taken and the initiatives they intend to take. In fact, the website of uh, IPFA is also very speaking on the various initiatives taken by the authority and what they have in mind for future. At the end, I thank you all for patient hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rakesh. Uh, I now request Madam Anita Shah Keller to come uh, and uh, give us the keynote address. She is a 1996 batch officer from the Indian Audit Account Service uh, and has uh, uh, recently taken over as CEO of IPFA. Uh, so uh, she's also a member of the governing board of IBBI. Uh, so welcome, madam. We look forward to your address. Good morning, all. Shri J.K. Das, Executive Director, RBI. Shri Rakesh Jain, member of the IPF Authority. Dr. Mridil Sagar, the Chair Professor in CAER. My colleague Tushar Anand and Sumitrane, General Managers of the IPFA Authority. All my team members of IPFA and the esteemed guests from the professional and academic institutions and students. It is indeed my pleasure to be with all of you as we commemorate the Foundation Day of the Investor Awareness and Protection Fund Authority. On this momentous occasion, we have organized a seminar on the investor awareness and protection, which is our key job 
in collaboration with the NCAER. Given my varied audience, I mean, some of you who may know about IPFA, some of you who are working in IPFA, and others who might be wondering why you've been called and what is this organization all about? And how is it related to you? You would have many such questions in your mind, uh, in your young inquisitive mind and not so young yet inquisitive minds. Before I go whole hog into explaining to you what is IEPFA, let me ask you a few questions. Do you agree that in order to take important financial decisions, it is uh, imperative for you to have sufficient information about various financial uh, products, the do's and don'ts of savings, of budgeting, of investments, where you can invest, where you should invest, where you should not invest, what is safe, what is not. Should you trust every scheme that has been advertised to you? It could be Shah Rukh Khan, it could be Amir Khan, it could be anyone. As you've been seeing the shot that we have played, that should you be trusting them and just going ahead and doing what you uh, invest wherever they are asking you to? Is that safe? Is that guaranteed? How do you make money multiply? Does money grow on trees and then you just keep watering it and it grows into a big plant? Well, a lot of people think it happens that way. What about the lure of the online games of cryptocurrency? Should you protect your hard-earned money or should you just put it wherever anybody's told you to put it and let go of it? And then also what happened to the shares and dividends that were purchased long, long back by you, by your parents, by your grandparents, which have been bequeathed to you, and whether you are able to retrieve it, do you forget about it, what is the process of retrieving it? All these questions, the answer is IEPFA, which has been formed for this very purpose. Imagine a situation where your father suddenly recalls that he's got these uh, hard copy of share certificates. You are aware that share certificate share is now traded in a DMAT format and it is not in a hard copy format. But supposing you have these hard copies and what do you do with them? Because you go anywhere, these hard copies on today's date have no value. And there has been a circular that after 2025, uh, all these... Uh, shares will invariably have to be in a dematted form. And often very many of us keep changing houses, keep changing addresses. We live in rented houses, we our jobs change, and we keep losing the paper. Every transfer is a pain. You end up losing some paper, you have some paper, you don't know what to do with it. You sometimes put it away in a box, and then after many years when you take out that box, then you see, Are isme to share certificates pade hain. and you have a lot of other things. So what do you do in those circumstances? Now, would you have lost, allowed your father or your grandfather or yourself to lose all this hard-earned money just because you forgot to take the dividend over the uh, so many years? No. Herein comes in the role of the IPFA. Now, keeping in view the concern of the common people, Government of India established the Investor Education and Protection Fund Authority under the Section 125 of the Companies Act 2013. This was dedicated for the administration of the IPF fund. After the new digital pro processes came in place, the investors who did not claim dividend and whose dividends and possibly shares were transferred to the IPF authority after uh, n uh, the claimant not being traced for seven years, the entire thing gets transferred to IPF authority. And now with this uh, 2013 act, it, uh, I, the government has given you an opportunity to raise a claim for these shares and dividends and get it back. So um, the uh, the person, the claimants come to the uh, IEPFA, get uh, register themselves uh, and their details on the IEPF.gov.in, file an application with the details of their dividend and the proof of their identity. And after verification, where we, the IPFA, verify that you are the right person with the company, thereafter we distribute the shares and dividends back to you as the rightful owner. 
in fact over the years that we've been established that is from 2016 onwards we have uh, probably disbursed more than 29 crores of dividends and 54 crore claims have been settled so far and as the awareness of the service of IPFA spreads, we assume that the problem is gradually likely to be minimized, that everybody would know that their money is safe with IPFA and they can claim it back. And for the shares that are held, held in DMAT account, it is assumed that uh, since the KYC process is on, so uh, your date KYC details are updated regularly. So this, uh, you will be able to claim your shares and dividends on time. Now, while refunding crores of amounts through dividends and shares of common people belonging to different sections of claimant, we have realized that in investors should also be made aware of many important aspects which they are otherwise uninformed about. We uh, try to ensure that the investors are aware, informed about all the necessary aspects of uh, financial decisions and keeping their money safe and they are protected from fraudulent practices like the Ponzi schemes. The IPFA also, other than uh, giving back the shares and dividends, has another mandate. Uh, it has essentially got two mandates. One is the refund of unclaimed funds to the right foot claimant and investor awareness protection with a broader goal of fi inclusive financial literacy and you would agree that financial literacy starts young and it is a very very important aspect of our lives now so, therefore since its inspection inception six years back ipfa has been committed to pr promote the investor awareness protection and refund of unclaimed shares dividends etc the best part which makes IPFA different from other organizations such as SEBI, RBI, etc. is that it is the youngest and the only organization which has a legislative mandate of spreading financial literacy, keeping in fact the, that all prospective investors are po potential assets to contribute to the great growth story of the nation and also therefore it is imperative for us to protect their financial health. When we started our journey as a statutory body under the aegis of the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, we have reached out to the rural investors, mostly the low-income group people who do not know. They save uh, one, one penny and then they do not know how to multiply that money. A lot of them uh, simply place, uh, take this money and place it in some portly and put it to a side. Uh, they do not know how to multiply it and as you are aware the inflationary value of money the value of money keeps decreasing so how do you multiply how do you survive in these kind of circumstances do you end up investing wherever you have to or wherever you are told or do you invest in places which are uh, safe which ensure multiplicity of your money over a period of time so this all education we have been taking up uh, for all different uh, subsets of uh, groups we have financial groups we have groups like uh, uh, college students school students we like to catch them young make them financially literate then we also have the low income groups uh, the self help groups all these people all fishermen uh, people probably vegetable sellers or uh, those kind of people also we are targeting. We are targeting every possible strata to ensure that they are all financially literate. So we have identified a few agencies such as CSE e-governance service to conduct the investor awareness programs in probably 117 aspirational districts of rural India. In fact, a recent study done by the IIT Delhi has suggested that these IAPs have brought, actually brought visible changes in the quality of life of the participants. Many of them have started actually saving and making small investments in government schemes. Besides, they've also learned how to use digital transactions such as, you go to any vegetable vendor, he says, Paytm Kardo, yeah, he has that uh, QR thing which you uh, scan. So they are, they are into digital currency and a lot of such things in order, this has made their life much simpler. And uh, you are aware of the jam scheme of the government also, that is the, uh, which uses mobile Aadhaar for your banking and financial inclusion. So this is all, we are uh, raising a lot of in, uh, investor awareness in all those areas also. 
Prior to that, we, uh, in fact, uh, people only were aware of fixed deposits or post office savings scheme. And there were many fraudulent practices that were going on in the Ponzi scheme, et cetera, where, you know, some uh, chit fund scheme was there where you invest uh, maybe uh, get a small chit and then you get the money. We have seen at least, uh, uh, I have uh, noticed to my own this thing that there are a huge number of these chit fund companies which have gone bankrupt, have sunk, and uh, with that they've taken everybody's money. So our, uh, we, it is our endeavor to educate people not to fall for these kind of schemes. So IEPFA is a unique organization. We aim to deliver our best, and we have a lot of constraints. IEPFA strives to be sensitive to the needs of claimants, and we work continuously to make the process of claim hassle-free. We have a set of handful but enthusiastic group of officers doing their best to provide education and protect, protect the interest of the investors. Today is our foundation day, but even then you would notice that a lot of us are back there working. Only a handful of them have, uh, have come to attend this function, though they could have had the whole day off, but they have preferred to stay back and process the claim so that no investor suffers. You must be thinking that IEPF is only for those who have to get their refunds of unclaimed dividends or share. We Again, I would like to say that we are reaching out to the present investors and also to the future investors. We have, uh, for instance, we have started our live lecture series through the 24 by 7 education channel of IGNO, that is Gyan Darshan. Every Thursday and Friday, our expert resource personnel deliberate on different relatable and yet not much known subjects. And we have been able to disseminate and inform people about safe investing, alert them about prevalence scam through the outreach activities by multiple kind of investor awareness program. We've got a customized investor awareness program for the rural semi-urban semi urban areas where we are looking at inclusive financial literacy, creating awareness about the relevant financial products simplifying the social welfare schemes of the government, awareness against the fraudulent practices, Ponzi schemes, negating the role of middlemen for claims, settlement process through IPFA. In fact, what, uh, uh, what happens usually is that uh, when those physical shares are found, uh, now since they're very old, so there are some requirements of documents, et cetera, and then people, uh, a lot of middlemen, get that information and they come back to you and say that I will do the entire documentation, aap khali sign kar dena. you give me 40% of the market value. We do not encourage that, there is no requirement to make any payment to anybody, the process is hassle free. In our office here in uh, Delhi, we have a PRO and he has a team of people who can assist them in filling up the forms and getting the refund. And uh, we have ende endeavored to improve the efficiency by expediting the process. We have adapted to the changing circumstances. We are using a completely e-office digital based approach. We have a mobile app and we are disseminating a lot of posts on our Twitter accounts, on our Facebook accounts, etc. And we are also having this quest for the hunger for excellence is something which can never be situated. So we are we were looking at citizen centric approach. Uh, for example, during the Azadi ka Amrit Amahotsav, we have started a special window facility for the senior citizens along with a dedicated help desk. I, the intent was that our senior citizens should not be made to wait in queues, wait for a long time. Immediately, there's somebody who will attend to the this thing and we will process their claim very quickly. Now, speaking about citizen participants, I have uh, to mention one thing, that uh, we are announcing a mascot design contest called Pehchan, which will be live through the MyGo uh, portal. The idea behind this contest is that if IPFA is a organization that exists for the people, it is the people who need to make the mascot and own it. And it is through this mascot that uh, we intend that the IEPFA would be uh, recognized. And it is that mascot which will be uh, flowing through all our uh, future uh, TVCs, etc. 
and any any uh, information uh, investor awareness uh, programs we will be having that mascot so i welcome all of you to please participate and give us a very good mascot so you can share with us your idea of IPFA, what you've understood, or how you want the face of IPFA to be identified with the common man. The moment they see that mask, they should understand that here is the person who's protecting your money. If someone wants to know what IPFA has done for so far over the years, we have research papers, studies, we have a lot of literature and reports available on our website, social media platform, as well as our mobile application. Besides knowing that uh, we only have a handful of officers, we have a very transparent process of first in, first out. So there is a queue, it's a queuing process where the person who gets in first gets his claim first and then so on. So we, we there are a lot of challenges. I would not say no, we are still a very young organization. We have a long way to go. However, we will take all possible steps to ensure that the settlement and disposal process is very quick. We have a diverse and a very open roadmap. We are willing to take in uh, any suggestion. And we, we are looking towards promoting financial literacy for school children. Uh, we, we plan to have interesting games, modules, comic books, videos, and uh, our uh, mobile app is also likely to undergo an upgrade. And uh, we want to make it more interactive. And we are always open for adapting to new technologies, suggestions, so that we understand our stakeholders better make them comfortable and make them interact with us to cater with to their di diverse requirements. I'm sure our sessions on common man and financial literacy by the Reserve Bank of India, common man on investor protection by IPFA and CAER, and a very interesting technical session on the investor protection in a digital world by our distinguished panel of experts will be really apt and useful. I would like to congratulate IPFA and all our stakeholders for the journey so far. Moreover, we are determined to reach out to all sections of the stakeholders so that by the next Foundation Day celebration, we would see a representation and exchange of idea from all the sections in a bigger gathering in a much more uh, dynamic and uh, bigger form. So I look forward to have making the citizens of India, the children and the youth uh, financially aware, empowered, and as a strong nation contributors. Stay informed, stay empowered with IPFA. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this very, very enlightening uh, uh, history of the IPFA and the road forward. We'll now request uh, Shri M.R. Shrikant uh, from Reserve Bank of India uh, for his awareness session for the common man on financial literacy. Uh, very good morning to all of you, respected dignities on the dais and participants. And I congratulate everyone on the foundation day of uh, IEPFA. Uh, so my name is uh, M.R. Srikant. I am working with the Financial Inclusion and Development Department of uh, Reserve Bank of India New Delhi office. And as uh, with uh, the mandate which was which ma'am I just talked about IEPFA, the so Financial Inclusion Development Department also conducts various financial literacy programs for various target groups such as students, colleges, uh, self-help groups uh, and such. So it is also our endeavor that we should uh, uh, start financial education uh, right from the beginning, right from school, uh, because uh, although we have uh, re uh, uh, made many strides in literacy, like we are, I think uh, our literacy rate is 75 percent as of now, but our financial literacy of our common public is still at 27 percent. So a lot of people who are even literate 
uh, who are not able to make uh, money work for them, uh, or not able to grow money, or not able to do proper budgeting, saving, responsible borrowing. So my session is geared towards uh, giving you the basics of, uh, of uh, financial awareness. I would like to talk about uh, uh, savings, the approach that needs to be taken for savings, and why savings matters really, why should one save? I mean, the people think it's a very intuitive uh, uh, answer, but knowing why one needs to save uh, sorts, solves a lot of questions that one has in the future. The various types of investments which are available for, for your savings, digital banking which has taken uh, a lot of uh, prominence in the past few, few years, and the frauds uh, which have been uh, uh, conducted because of which many people lose their life savings. So I'd like to talk about uh, how to prevent oneself from, uh, from digital frauds. The various grievance redressal mechanisms, both as part of RBI and part of the internal ombudsman of, uh, of banks and other uh, uh, financial institutions. Um, and since I believe there are a lot of college students uh, who have come here to attend this, uh, this uh, session, so I've included a, a small uh, portion on MSMEs and startups, because I feel that a lot of uh, uh, our nation's youth, our current uh, uh, generation, instead of wanting to be uh, job seekers, they want to be job creators. And the government and everyone here at RBI and NCER and want to promote that. So there are various uh, financial assistance schemes which are uh, available under this uh, under uh, this program. And uh, lastly, so one of the major functions of RBI is uh, management of currency. So I'd like to talk about uh, the various security features of uh, banknotes and the uh, note refund rules. So in case you have a mutilated note or a defective note in your possession, what to do about it. So we have a lot planned here. I'd like to, uh, uh, are you able to see the presentation? Just one minute. Uh, Yes, huh. thank you. So, first thing, I would like to keep this session a little bit interactive. Uh, how many of you don't have a bank account, especially among the students here? Anyone who does not have a bank account? Okay, fine, everyone has a bank account, that's good. Uh, anyone who doesn't use digital payment products out of fear that digital uh, payment products say, I don't understand, I want my cash to be in my hand, I don't understand if it's in the computer or in my mobile. Any, everyone's comfortable using digital payment products, that's very good. So this is one question which I start all my sessions with, whether it's a school student or a senior citizen, ki how should one view savings? So they're both the same equations, so the, that's not the issue here, but the, uh, the philosophy makes all the difference. So do you do savings after you make all your expenditure? Or do you do savings in an active way that, okay, I've got my salary on the first, I make sure that a certain percentage of it goes into savings, and then for the rest of the month, I do my expenditure. So maybe a show of hands, uh, who goes for option A? Option A, fine. So maybe around 10, 20%, op everyone else is option B? How many for option B? Okay, around uh, 30, 40%, okay. Remaining don't save? or some other approach uh, they ap apply for uh, for their savings. Anyone can elaborate if they want to. So which of them is the right answer? Can anyone speak out loud? B option. B option. Can you elaborate, ma'am? OK. But what if I, my contingency is right now? I can't. I don't have any scope for saving. I have a medical emergency. I have some, you know, uh, uh, shadi in the family. Something I need to spend money on. Well, that is what we have to practice. I must have yes. Yes. Thank you so much, ma'am. Big round of applause for ma'am here. <laughs> yes. So she talked about uh, two things very beautifully. First is savings has to be a practice. It should be a habit. It should be a discipline which should be enforced. So generally what happens, especially students who've just uh, uh, graduated and or just started with their jobs, when they get their salary, they're so eager to you know spend that uh, money in, in the first go. And uh, banks or anyone else will try to you know rope them in by giving them credit card offers, buy one, get one free. It, the world becomes so attractive that you just want to spend, spend, spend. But in that spending process, you realize that you're actually, uh, uh, you know, um, compromising your future, because savings has to be an active, uh, active habit. 
the first first uh, uh, approach is a passive passive one Ki, okay fine we'll see how much we can save towards the end of the month let's spend but uh, as ma'am said ki any contingency can come any uh, um, you know uh, incentive may come you may be attracted to something so you will end up not saving at, at the end of the day so something or the other expenditure will come so you have to make sure that a certain percentage it can be 20% 10% 50% depending on your uh, capability capacity and need you a certain percentage has to be saved r up front and then saved in certain instruments which will give you a positive rate of return uh, keep you from inflation uh, provide a uh, you know safety cushion for your uh, for your emergencies and such so the second approach is what i would recommend everyone to uh, to follow and there are various instruments now which uh, help. Uh, I'll be talking about them in a uh, little bit detail later on, like recurring deposit, where a portion of your money of your savings account will be put into a fixed deposit on a monthly basis. Uh, an SIP, a systematic investment plan for mutual funds, where you can start as low as 500 rupees per month for, for investment into mutual funds and such. So for savings, there are many uh, factors that one needs to consider. One the key thing is inflation and time value of money. I think Ma'am talked about uh, portlies. So whenever we ask uh, school students, uh, how do you save your money, which uh, maybe your grandmother gives you on your birthday or something, so they just say ki hum gulak mein rakhte hain. So we ask them ki gulak se fayda kya, aap log bank account mein kyun nahi rakhte ho? Nii aamko acha maza aata hai, usko aise toadke usme paisa nikalne se. So they just go for that sort of a thing, but they don't realize that that money is, uh, the value of the money is being eroded. 100 rupees now will not buy you as much, has not got that much purchasing power, which will, uh, which it will maintain for the next one year, two year. It will, it will, it will reduce. So we should put it in an instrument which will give you a positive rate of return. What is positive rate of return? Rate of return which is above inflation. So a simple uh, metric here, okay, inflation is five, six percent right now. If you're putting it in a uh, savings account deposit which gives you four percent, you're not beating the inflation. You're still getting a negative two percent return. If you're keeping it just in like you know your Godrej locker or under your mattress so you're not you're earning zero percent you're actually losing money while you're keeping it there so it's very important to understand the time value of money and uh, basically keep as much cash or as much running uh, 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 fund for your day-to-day -day needs remaining you can keep in an instrument which is liquid the next which is the next uh, next important factor so liquidity depends on your time horizon of investment so suppose you want to um, uh, is save for uh, investing for a house. So you can put it in an instrument which will be 10 years, 20 years, maybe in a government bond. But suppose you want to save for uh, may paying your um, bills six months down the line or having an, uh, you know, uh, wedding expenses or something which is a short term thing. So you have to put in a short term instrument, maybe a short term FD or, or a short term government bond, that sort of a thing. So that will depend again on your need and your uh, your, your capacity. So third point is risk versus return. This is again a very, uh, very important uh, uh, thing which not many people fully, fully appreciate because uh, people tend to either focus on one or the other. Either we'll have completely risk averse people who will be uh, just wanting to say ki humko share market mein paisa nahi dalna hai, hamesha doob jata hai, we'll only put in FDs, we'll only put in gold. But that sort of behavior also uh, is not uh, conducive for a full uh, comprehensive uh, financial development. Or either you'll have the opposite kind of people who will be like, hum return ke hi, uh, we, we will focus on. We will just um, put all our money in uh, stock market and uh, you know, double our money in three months, double our money in six months, that sort of a thing. It is a, it is a trade-off. The, the higher return you, you aspire for, you'll have to have that much risk appetite. So both go to, uh, hand in hand together. Uh, so, um, next point is diversification. So this is again one of those things which needs to be put in practice. This is similar to uh, the previous uh, uh, factor, this is risk versus return. If you put all your money in fixed deposit or put all your money in share market, uh, you will not be able to uh, take the benefit of arbitrage between the different, uh, different uh, asset classes or a different uh, financial products. So generally it is said that stock market and uh, gold are inversely uh, related. So suppose if you put money only in stock market or only in gold, whenever the price of stock market uh, crashes or gold crashes, you will lose all your investment. But suppose if you had divided your investment equally into stock market and gold, so you would take the benefit uh, whenever stock market prices reduce, your gold portfolio will increase. So you will continue to maintain your, uh, your net value. So it's important to uh, uh, diversify your investment, your savings as well. You know, like the old saying goes, not to put all your eggs in one basket. So uh, next point is nomination, which is a very, very important thing. Uh, Reserve Bank of India has been, as part of its RBI campaign, has stressed upon this quite a bit. That uh, 
any time you uh, you uh, sign up for any uh, yeah, savings product or any uh, any investment make sure that you uh, uh, nominee, uh, in, include a nominee in the in the form whether it's a physical form or digital form it can be anyone who's related to you because uh, these sort of things one doesn't plan for. We generally think, yeah, dekho, we'll see baad mein dekh lenge, nominee ka. but right at the time of uh, making your investment or making your savings, you should uh, fill your nominee. So that later on, you know, when the unthinkable does happen, you, will, you or your family members will not be, uh, you know, uh, uh, given a problem to. Last is uh, time horizon and end use. So again, savings have to be uh, inculcated as a habit and this becomes easier if, you're, if you know your goal. So I want to save for an education loan, I want to save for buying a car, I want to save for, uh, uh, for, for a house. So if you have an end goal in mind, it, is, it, it becomes uh, uh, very uh, easy for you to uh, inculcate the discipline of, uh, uh, of savings. And then your time horizon also becomes clear. So one more question key. So I've talked about savings as a you know uh, tool to safeguard your future. But can savings only meet all your uh, financial needs and emergencies? I think ma'am had uh, the, uh, the her answer just now. She had alluded to this a little bit. But can anyone tell me key, sa can savings solve all your problems, all your financial needs? So what 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 does saving what is savings not good for? If that's the direct question, if I can ask. I think ma'am had uh, talked about uh, health emergency, you have to use insurance. That's a very key uh, important difference that one needs to understand. People tend to think you, know, want to, you want to save for a rainy day and rainy day includes all sorts of emergencies including health emergencies. Problem is that you cannot save for health. You never know what ailment you're going to get in future, where you'll have to get treatment, how much they'll charge. It's, uh, it's, a, it's something that you cannot plan for, you cannot aim for. So instead of that, instead of saving for such a uh, thing which you cannot uh, imagine or uh, think about, it is best that you enroll for an insurance scheme for under, under health uh, or even for life insurance. So uh, under this, um, uh, 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 this uh, Pradhan Mantri uh, social security schemes, there are two schemes, Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bhima Yojana, which is the life insurance component, which is, provides two lakhs rupees worth of life insurance for just a premium of 436 rupees per annum. So if you do the math, I think it is hardly 35 rupees per month, just, just over a uh, rupee a day. So just over a rupee a day can ensure your life insurance of, uh, of two lakh rupees. So this is a very, uh, very uh, ch cheap life insurance, uh, so as to say, and this, this, for this, there's no separate uh, proce procedure. Whenever you open a bank account, as part of the bank account form, there are uh, certain schemes that you can endure for. If you just tick them, uh, add your nominee name, and uh, give the permission to auto debit from your bank account for this uh, premium of 436 rupees per annum, you will be enrolled in the schemes. So as part of our uh, review of credit in various districts of NCDU Delhi, we see that even though many people have bank accounts, enrollment under this, these schemes is very low. It's uh, not even 50%, 60% uh, uh, in most of the districts. So I would request if uh, most of you have these bank accounts, if you're not already enrolled for life insurance, you pl uh, please try, uh, uh, contact your bank, bank official and ask whether you can enroll them for, uh, for not, or not. For 436 rupees per annum, you're getting a life insurance worth 2 lakhs. It is, I think, a good, uh, good uh, proposition. Similarly, for the accidents, uh, accident insurance, there's a scheme called Pradhan Mantri Suraksha Bhima Yojana. Here, the premium is 20 rupees per annum. So for just 20 rupees, you get an accidental insurance of 2 lakh rupees. Uh, for full disability and even to, to even for debt due to disability for partial disability i think it is 1 lakh rupees so this is uh, valid for one year every year they will be will be charged a premium every year the the the, the insurance uh, pre, uh, validity renews so i would request all of you to have a look at uh, this uh, pradhan mantri jeevan jyoti bima yojana and pradhan mantri suraksha bima yojana and most importantly i think many of you may already be enrolled in some life insurance or health insurance maybe some uh, from some other bank or some other private player but this is especially useful for those people who are coming from rural backgrounds or who are from the uh, poorer strata of the society i would request each and every one of you maybe you can tell your maids uh, your drivers or anyone who's working and who falls under these categories that uh, the, these sort of schemes exist you can contact the bank official and enroll for them so coming back to savings, so as part of diversification, these are the various kind of instruments that is available uh, for, uh, for, impro uh, for improving your rate of return. So fixed deposit, everyone knows there's normal kind of fixed deposit and there's a recurring fixed deposit. So a recurring, like I had mentioned, ki every, every month or every uh, you know, uh, frequency, 
the period which you select. Uh, a certain amount of money is uh, taken automatically from your saving account and put in a recurring deposit, which earns the FT rate, which is higher than the savings rate. Government bonds you can invest in. You can also invest in corporate bonds. Government bonds, I'll uh, elaborate a bit. There's a RBI initiative called RBI Retail Direct Scheme. So I'll talk about that in a, in a, in a little bit. You can also invest in gold, but gold is one of those investments which does not contribute to the productive uh, productivity of the economy. Gold is similar to cash in that way. Although it's a good way to diversify your uh, savings, you can uh, uh, take benefit of the appreciation that happens in gold. But gold cannot be put to use for the economy as, as a whole, like uh, similar to bank, bank account uh, savings or uh, uh, or, or uh, even stock, uh, stocks or mutual funds as such, because the money is not flowing back into the economy, it is basically sitting in your home. So although you can use gold to diversify, but again, try to explore other asset classes as well. Uh, stocks and mutual funds, they will give you higher returns, but like I said, they also have, uh, have higher risk compared to the previous ones which I just discussed. PPF is also a good uh, saving instrument, it also gives you a tax benefit under the triple E exempt rule. Uh, exchange traded funds similar to stocks and mutual funds. National pension scheme, most of the government employees are already part of it. This is again one of those things which uh, inculcate discipline. So a certain portion of your salary, a certain portion of contribution from your employer is directly put into your uh, pension fund so that you can uh, uh, use it for your uh, uh, retirement. Real estate, if you want to uh, really diversify your uh, asset class and uh, uh, go for larger, uh, larger assets. So these are the very broad, basic uh, type of saving account. I'm sure there are a lot of derivative pro products now which one can use to even further divest their savings. So this, uh, um, regarding investment in government bonds, RBI has uh, uh, undertaken an initiative called RBI Retail Direct Scheme, which is a one-stop solution uh, to facilitate investment in government securities by individuals. So the key point here is individuals. So earlier, when you would like to invest in a government security or a government bond, treasury bill, uh, state development loan, or sovereign gold bond, you had to go through a broker, a broker or a mutual fund house or any, you know, there has to be some person who is doing that transaction on your behalf. So now what happens is that under this uh, RBI Retail Direct scheme, the website is given in red here. It's HTTPS RBI Retail Direct .org .in. You can log in and open an account directly with RBI called the Retail Direct Guilt account, the RDG account. And once you open this account, you can uh, participate in the primary and the secondary market of both the uh, uh, central government, state government, treasury bills, uh, and uh, the sovereign gold bonds uh, market. And the key point here to remember is that there is no fee. So for a broker, you'll have to pay some, some commission, some charges for handling your government bond account. So for opening an account with RBI, there is no fee for charging the uh, charge for maintaining this, uh, this account with RBI. So this was uh, uh, announced by the Honorable Prime Minister in November of 2021 as a way to democratize this market. So this was dominated by institutional investors earlier because it was so hard for individuals to uh, directly buy uh, government bonds. So and, and it's a way for it's a very safe and secure way to to divest your investment uh, portfolio because it is backed by the sovereign. So I'd like to just show one uh, video regarding uh, this RBI Retail Direct Scheme. RBI Retail Direct Yojana Aaj desh mein logon ke liye nivesh ke kai vikalp uplabdh hain Zaruri ye hai ki ye vikalp surakshit aur aasan ho Government securities mein nivesh ek aisa vikalp hai jo poonji ko surakshit rakhte hue achhe return pradan karta hai Phir bhi chote niveshak vetan bhogi aur pension bhogi government securities ki khareed aur bikri ko jatil mante hain इस प्रक्रिया को आसान बनाने के लिए भारतीय रिजर्व बैंक ने छोटे निवेशकों के लिए आर रिटेल डायरेक्ट स्कीम शुरू की है जिससे निवेशक आसानी से गवर्नमेंट सिक्योरिटीज में निवेश कर सकते हैं इस योजना के तहत निवेशक न केवल पूरे विश्वास से अपनी जमा पूंजी का निवेश कर पाएंगे बल्कि देश के आर्थिक विकास में योगदान भी कर सकेंगे अब छोटे निवेशक एक ऑनलाइन पोर्टल आर बी आई द्वारा RBI में अपना गिल्ट अकाउंट यानी प्रतिभूति खाता खोलकर अपने बैंक खाते से सीधे गवर्नमेंट सिक्योरिटीज में निवेश कर सकेंगे यह सुविधा निशुल्क है
So that was a brief uh, video about RBI Retail Direct Steam. So those of you who are interested, please log on to that uh, website and consider uh, um, uh, investing in uh, any one of the government bonds. So then savings, from savings we move on to borrowing. So borrowing for meeting your credit needs in the short term or the long term. So again, there are certain things that one needs to consider for, uh, for borrowing. So one of the key things which uh, we so learn when we're in school but we sort of forget and even uh, from senior citizens, businessmen, all sorts of people, they forget this, uh, this basic difference between needs versus wants. So when borrowing, one needs to understand what their needs are and what their wants are. Needs are limited, but wants, unfortunately, they're unlimited. Yeah, so for if you're taking a loan for a need, so need can be anything say, like a businessman who wants to uh, take a car loan so that he can you know, conduct his business in a much more fast and efficient manner. He wants to, uh, wants to upgrade from a scooter to a car. That is a, that is a need, uh, but suppose uh, like what generally what happens in our like in normal society that you know, if uh, everything is fine but your neighbor buys a big TV or a bigger car, you have this desire inside you, okay, I also want to buy something like this to sort of, you know, maintain the parity. So that, that is not a need, that is a want. So these sort of things, they will never be, a, 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 you know, a cap on such, on your, on your wants. So important to understand what you're using your, uh, your, uh, your borrowing for. Next point is timely repayment and credit score. So this is again one thing which people sort of uh, give a, uh, say, uh, no, doesn't, you don't give a second look towards, ki whenever the credit card bill comes, they want to, okay, just pay to, till the la wait till the last date or pay the minimum uh, amount and uh, uh, get by with. Unfortunately, what happens is on the surface, definitely uh, you will have to pay the late payment charges, which are quite exorbitant. But at, uh, below the surface, your credit score gets really, uh, uh, affected by such such a behavior because you are effectively telling the institution or whoever is uh, who you have taken the borrowing from that you're not a credit worthy uh, uh, individual. So credit score is a number between 300 to 900 which is assessed by uh, the credit information companies such as Sybil and uh, the, the closer your number to 900, to 900 the more credit worthy you are and uh, behavior such as this such as timely uh, not paying uh, your dues on time, not maintaining min minimum balance and uh, not having a relationship with the bank. So this is again one more uh, important thing which I want to talk about. So generally what happens is, especially among the older generation, there is this uh, fear of not using bank accounts. They, they continue with this uh, uh, habit of using cash. So even if the money is deposited into the bank account, it comes in a digital form, the, their salary, they would uh, go to the ATM or they would go to the bank and withdraw it full, uh, in, in full in cash. And they would not use the banking uh, system for their uh, for their uh, transactions. A credit history is not developed with the bank. So, but the thing is, whenever they want to apply for a loan, such as a car loan or a uh, or a home loan, that's the first time they effectively approach the bank for to address their credit needs. They uh, the bank tells them that we cannot give you a loan or we'll give you a loan at uh, such a high rate. And they are they are uh, basically flummoxed. Key, why am I getting? I have never you know not paid a. Um, missed my dues or never made any, any mistake, why am I being charged for such a high amount? The issue is that bank uh, will not sort of only consider the documents you're submitting, bank will also look at your history. What is the relationship that you've had with the, uh, with the bank over the past few years? So if you are using the bam, your bank account in a frequent manner, you're making all your, uh, uh, all your purchases, all your transactions are happening through it, you're using the credit card frequently, you're making the payments on time. So then the bank knows about your transaction history, it can assess whether this is a, uh, a credit worthy person, whether the borrowing uh, 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 request is uh, commensurate with this uh, capacity to repay. So all those things can be taken into consideration. So the credit history becomes a very crucial uh, aspect when, when uh, determining your credit score. So uh, those of you who have credit cards, those of you who have taken loans, uh, kindly ensure that you may make the, uh, the, the installment payment in full on time. The third point is interval of rate of interest and then lastly type of borrowing institution. This I would like to address by, uh, by, uh, by another question. So this again, uh, I would like to ask the, the audience here, who among the following would uh, you consider taking a loan from? Bank A or person B? Bank A, anyone who wants to take from person B, but he is offering only at 2%. Any logical, rational person would want to go for a lower interest rate, right? Anyone who wants to, uh, like, sorry? 
Gold loan, sorry. It can be any loan, sir. The, the, it, the idea is to understand the difference between the rate of interest. It can be any loan, gold loan, agricultural loan. But the bank is giving a 12%, that other person is giving a 2%. So who would you like to take it from? Gold loan. Uh, out of these two, two, these two options. Second be is more beneficial. Beneficial for you, okay. Anyone who would agree with him? Uh, right now, these are the only terms, ma'am. <laughs> yes, so exactly. So this is an aware, aware, uh, aware customer. So uh, what happens generally is the bank, whenever would he, uh, they would uh, give you a loan, they would give you all the terms and conditions. They would be transparent because they're a formal institution, regulated entity. But any person, any money lender, anyone on the uh, in the market you're taking the loan from, they are not so so obligated to give you the uh, the uh, terms and conditions or make you uh, these terms and conditions explicit to you. So generally, he would. What happens in like uh, like a rural area is like bank ke pas mat jana bank to bahut uh, documents puchta hai bahut interest 12 percent pe lega hum to aapse 2 percent pe lege. But what happens is that that 2 percent comes with a very big extra smart. It is per month. They will not tell you all this or they will not make it very clear to you. So if you take the effective rate of interest, it is all, all, two times twelve as 24 percent, almost more than 24 percent. If you take the effective uh, rate of interest, so you're not you're not benefiting by taking with the person person B. So our request from uh, our, our, our endeavor is to basically formalize these the the borrowing uh, habits of all the people. Ki, you, instead of going to the local money lender or uh, you know local known person who would give you money, fine they would not give you money. Uh, money uh, they would give you your loan without any KYC document or anything. They'll, the initial transaction may be easier for you, but later on when they these terms and conditions get revealed to you and then you will not be able to pay, make the payment. Uh, keep up with making the payments. These these things get exorbitant uh, very quickly. So our request is that whenever you want to take a loan, you take it from formal institutions, from regulated entities such as banks, uh, pri any public sector bank, private sector banks, small finance banks, uh, even NBFCs, uh, rural, uh, regional rural banks, cooperative banks, and such. So one key thing is transparency, as ma'am said, ki they will make sure that the terms and conditions are known to you. Even you should also ask them, ki, what, what does this term and condition mean? Can you clarify this? They are obligated to explain the ter important terms and conditions to you. And then you give your, uh, your, uh, your consent before uh, taking the, the, uh, the loan. Second important uh, benefit of uh, borrowing from formal institutions is you get access to the digital banking system. So if you, you can make your payments through, through any of the digital modes, which I'll be elaborating on in a little bit. And third is that you'll be having access to the grievance redressal mechanism under the RBI Banking Obertsman Scheme. So uh, suppose uh, anything goes awry between you and the local money lender, you have no recourse. He can take the money uh, uh, and go away, or whatever, whatever asset you, you have kept underlying as collateral, you can just take that and go away. So there is no uh, redressal. You can go to the police station or anything, but then there's no guarantee that that uh, will be resolved. So uh, I want to elaborate a little bit on the digital banking products. Before that, I will just show you a little video on borrowing habits. रुकिए मेरी सुनिए जी जी कहिए बड़ी जल्दी है लोन चाहिए तो यहां ना आइए सीधे बैंक या आरबीआई रजिस्टर्ड फाइनेंस कंपनी में जाइए पर एक बात बताइए हां हां फरमाइए कहीं और से लोन लेने में क्या है दिक्कत क्योंकि बिना सोचे समझे लोन लोगे तो बढ़ेगी मुसीबत कैसे ज्यादा ब्याज भरना पड़ेगा धोखेबाजी का डर भी रहेगा आपने तो मुझे मुश्किलों से बचाया और सही वित्तीय पाठ पढ़ाया <laughs> समझदारी का रास्ता दिखाया आरबीआई कहता है वित्तीय अनुशासन चिंता मुक्त जीवन
Thank you. Thank you. हेलो सर आपके लोन का ई एम फिर से मिस हो गया हाँ हाँ एक दो दिन में भर दूंगा <laughs> ये बहाना छोड़िए थोड़ा खुलकर बोलिए लोन की किस्त समय से ही चुकाइए कुछ दिन लेट हुआ तो क्या हो जाएगा बताइए क्रेडिट हिस्ट्री हो जाएगी खराब और और क्या और बिगड़ जाएगा आर्थिक हिसाब किताब तो समय से लोन चुकाने के फायदे भी बताइए कान जरा यहाँ लाइए समय से लोन चुकाने की आदत डालोगे तो भविष्य में लोन आसानी से पाओगे ये हुई ना बात और आपने सीखा वित्तीय पाठ अब होगी नई शुरुआत आरबीआई कहता है वित्तीय अनुशासन चिंता मुक्त जीवन रेखा बिजनेस एक्सपेंशन लोन अप्रूव वाह नया एसी भी लेते हैं कब से प्लान कर रहे हैं हम्म और हॉलिडे भी क्यों नहीं इसी लोन में एडजस्ट कर लेंगे हाँ जरा रुकिए पहले इसे हटाइए जरा आप खुलकर बताइए जितनी जरूरत उतना ही लोन लीजिए और सोच समझ कर इस्तेमाल कीजिए उसका फायदा ना होगी कोई परेशानी और लोन चुकाने में होगी आसानी और कोई बात है हमें बतानी जरूरतों और चाहतों में है अंतर इस बात को समझे जिस काम के लिए लोन लिया है उसी पर खर्चे आपने समझाई काम की बात और सिखाया वित्तीय पाठ बेहतर कल का मिलेगा साथ आरबीआई कहता है वित्तीय अनुशासन चिंता मुक्त जीवन सो यस सो वी हैव टॉक्ट अबाउट सेविंग्स यू टॉक्ट अबाउट बोरोइंग नाउ आई लाइक टू मूव टू डिजिटल बैंकिंग व्हिच इज द व्हिच इज द मेन रीजन मेन वे हाउ बैंकिंग इज कंडक्टेड नाउ डेज आई मीन गोन ऑफ दोस डेज व्हेन यू हैव टू गो टू द ब्रांच to do take care of your ba banking needs there are people who still do that yes but uh, i mean uh, many people who have not seen the uh, their their branch or who actually don't even know where their branch is and still could do their uh, daily uh, banking transactions either through their mobile phone or internet banking i mean just a show of hands how many of you uh, actually go to your branch to do your ba banking needs still are there people who do that or, or people who prefer to do that okay and uh, remaining people they uh, they do mobile banking internet banking paytm that sort of a thing okay fine may i may i just know what is the reason if uh, if anyone can elaborate you why do you not prefer to use digital banking products well uh, when i started my account the digital banking was not an option okay Okay, but suppose uh, if you have to uh, transfer money during a holiday, a bank holiday, or sometime in the night for an emergency thing, what do you do then? Uh, so you use digital payment products. Fine, that's no doubt. So anyone who does not exclusively uses uh, phys uh, uses physical board of branch uh, banking goes to the branch and does banking. No, so that's what most people have uh, have uh, gone towards the digital mode. But the thing is, uh, there's uh, there are certain things that one needs to keep in account because. Uh, even though it has become convenient for you to do banking now, uh, now any day any time it's also become very easy for people who want to commit frauds so those things i would like to highlight here so just a brief overview of the various digital banking products that's available here one thing i would like to uh, uh, focus upon here is uh, ussd uh, unstructured uh, supplementary system data this is basically uh, uh, for accessing your bank account in a digital mode using without using the internet so generally we, what happens is ki whenever the internet goes down we cannot uh, use any banking uh, pro, uh, products or banking transactions but under ussd any feature phone that is a non smartphone if you uh, use the number star 99 hash and if your mobile phone is linked to your bank account you can uh, use your banking transactions as if you were connected to the internet so uh, uh, this thing is very useful in uh, rural areas or especially areas areas with uh, low connectivity 
uh, other enabled payment system is there. UPI is also there, which I'll talk about in a, in a, in a bit. Mobile wallets, bank paid, pre -car, uh, prepaid cards, internet banking, mobile banking, micro ATMs. So uh, the uh, underlying uh, system on which all these banking products uh, work on is, uh, is still is pretty much the same as what it was uh, 20 years back. So uh, most of the re recent uh, products are uh, based on IMPS, which is the immediate payment service. There are two different other uh, retail remittance uh, channels available, NEFT, which is National Electronic Fund Transfer, and RTGs, which is real-time gross settlement. So for immediate uh, transfer from one account to another account, uh, you can either use IMPS or RTGS. So then as the name indicates, immediate payment service IMPS in real time, uh, RTGS, real time gross settlement. So only difference is that in IMPS, uh, there's a maximum cap of 5 lakhs. It was earlier 2 lakhs, it has been revised to 5 lakhs uh, recently. And for uh, RTGS, there's a minimum limit of uh, 2 lakhs. So for your high value transactions, you can use RTGS. For remaining transactions, if you want to do them uh, on an instant basis, you can use IMPS. For remaining transactions, you can do NEFT. NEFT has no minimum amount, uh, 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 minimum limit, no maximum limit. But the only issue is, and this is key here because many people face this issue while using NEFT, is that it is not settled on an immediate basis. It is, it is, uh, it is settled on a half, yearly, uh, half hourly basis. So suppose you do NEFT and the transaction occurs and the money is debited from your account, but not credited in the other person's account. So please don't worry, uh, it'll, it, it takes around half an hour, one hour, you'll get that message and the money will be credited, credited, into, credited, credited into the account. That's how the system is, uh, is designed. So NEFT, this is the one, uh, one unique feature. So after NEFT, IMPS, RTGS, escaped the UPI revolution, and I think as can be seen from the graph here, the, the graph has been going up uh, constantly. I think in the February, uh, uh, this, uh, the last quarter of uh, the pre previous financial year, UPI was the most preferred uh, uh, payment product in the, with a market share of 64%, so leaving behind the previous legacy products like I IMPS, uh, RTGS, uh, and uh, uh, NEFT. So the reason for, for UPI's uh, uh, you know, popularity is because of its ease of use. So how many of you use UPI here? Yes, so I, it's very evident from this room as well. So how, but how many of you remember your bank account details? You must be remembering your bank account uh, UPI ID, but bank account details, your IFSC code, ha hardly a handful. So that's the innovation which happened here. He, uh, this UPI basically created this uh, UPI ID similar to your uh, your email ID. Like this, my name is Shrikan, Shrikan at the rate, UPI, Shrikan at the rate, SBI. So it's very easy to transfer money if I just share my UPI ID. Nowadays, it's e no, not even necessary to share your uh, UPI ID. You just share your QR code. And all you, all you have to do, do is scan, and it will automatically uh, you know, uh, fetch the, uh, uh, the uh, UPI details. So that uh, concealing the bank account details, that's also important privacy feature, easy to remember. It's also more secure. So again, this security also creates some issues. I'm so sure if many people who are using UPI may have faced this issue. So when you're changing your phone number from one to the other, uh, the UPI gets uh, disabled. So what you have to do is you have to again uninstall the UPI, reinstall it, and have the SMS sent again to the uh, UPI authority. Then only the phone, uh, register, uh, your mobile number will be registered on the UPI app. So that's the additional layer of uh, uh, um, author author authentication that's been provided. So the UPI will only work with your phone, with the phone, mobile phone registered on your uh, your number. So other things like internet banking, mobile banking, you just by your username and password, you can use somebody else's phone and log into it. But UPI, you cannot do that. Only the phone number which is registered with your bank account can be used for your, for your UPI. So another thing with UPI, which is important to know because a lot of frauds happen with this in this form is that uh, a lot of collect requests come on UPI. So someone sends a request on UPI saying that uh, so and so amount uh, is uh, has been requested from you. So uh, generally, it's uh, it's a habit to see the uh, see who you're sending the money to, what amount has been asked. But in in you know uh, in the Russian of day to day life, we don't do that. You just simply click and put your uh, UPI pin, and the money is de debited from your account. So whenever you get a request, you please ensure that you're getting it from a known person or an authorized person. That is a key uh, check that one needs to maintain as as a UPI user. So just one minute, I'll just show you a video. Mama? Yes, Goody. Why are you so scared of Nana Ji? I? No question. Papa? Yes, Papa. 10,000 rupees. Now, I'll send you to the bank.
डर गए ना इस डर को और बढ़ाते मतलब आज तो संडे रिलैक्स बैंक बंद है बैंकिंग सर्विसेज नहीं ये मिलेगी डेली चौबीसों घंटे कैसे अब बैंकिंग है आसान डिजिटल बैंकिंग सिर्फ एक उंगली का है काम बताओ कैसे भेजे एन एफ टी आई एम पी एस यूपीआई कोई भी वाह फाइनेंशियल ट्रांजेक्शन कहीं भी कभी भी अब मैं भी बनूंगा डिजिटल फिर नो डर अरे नाना जी पापा आरबीआई कहता है डिजिटल चुनो सुरक्षा के साथ गुड्डी किससे चैटिंग चल रही है मामा नो शेयरिंग कोई स्पेशल है हाँ बैंक अकाउंट डिटेल्स केवाईसी के लिए दस मिनट दीजिए कौन था बैंक केवाईसी अपडेट के लिए अकाउंट नंबर पिन और ओटीपी मांगा है और आप मान गए जब हम पर्सनल बातें हर किसी के साथ शेयर नहीं करते तो अपने बैंक अकाउंट की डिटेल्स क्यों शेयर करेंगे स्मार्ट गर्ल याद रहे मामा डिजिटल लेन देन के लिए किसी को भी अपने बैंक अकाउंट की डिटेल्स ना दे ओटीपी और पिन नंबर तो कभी नहीं हमेशा भरोसेमंद नेटवर्क का ही इस्तेमाल करें याद है ना नो शेयरिंग मामा आरबीआई कहता है डिजिटल चुनो सुरक्षा के साथ लिमिट में गुड्डी आज मेरा बर्थडे शॉपिंग होगी अनलिमिटेड अब मामा मेहरबान तो भांजी क्यों हो परेशान बढ़ गई कार्ड लिमिट तुमसे ही सीखा कार्ड में लिमिट सेट तो बड़े नुकसान की चिंता लिमिटेड और खर्चे भी लिमिटेड फिर भी कोई नुकसान हुआ तो बैंक में मोबाइल नंबर दर्ज करके रखो तुरंत अलर्ट मिलेगा समय से बैंक को बताया तो नो नुकसान बैंक नहीं माना तो तो आरबीआई के ओम्बर्जमैन से शिकायत कर सकते हैं वाह 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 खूब समझे आप डिजिटल बैंकिंग का पार्ट लो इधर भी लिमिट है आरबीआई कहता है डिजिटल चुनो सुरक्षा के साथ पेमेंट फेल पेमेंट फेल लेकिन पैसे तो कट गए गई मेरी मेहनत की कमाई हो जाएगी भर भाई चिंता मत कर मेरे भाई अगर डिजिटल ट्रांजैक्शन फेल हो जाए और अकाउंट से पैसे कट जाए तो बैंक समय से पैसे लौटा देगा वरना कॉम्पनसेशन का है प्रावधान नहीं तो आरबीआई के ऑम्बुड्समैन को शिकायत करें आप या बिल मेरी फीस आरबीआई कहता है जानकार बनिए सतर्क रहिए These are the various videos which were released as part of our Financial Literacy Week, which was organized this year in February, uh, on the theme of uh, safe and secure digital transactions. That has taken prominence because uh, I don't know whether it's clearly visible on the screen for all of you here. I'll just read it out here uh, because of messages like these. Uh, it's basically a message from Reserve Bank of India, official compensation payment say, from the Foreign Exchange Department. Saying that you have won a lottery of four crores, sixty-five lakhs, forty thousand, so and so, and uh, that has been arranged for you by the RBI governor. Very specifically, it is written there, and uh, or it's asking for your details, and verification, full name, address, uh, and it's telling you to reply to RBI dot funds release as India dot com. So, how many of you know what this is? it's a spam message so it is becoming very it's very clear and evident to you right that all this is a very fake message how why would anyone do such a thing but unfortunately as you can see everyone falls uh, prey to this senior citizens uh, you know financial uh, executives um, so kbc lottery messages such as this people lose their life savings there is some message saying that uh, you have passed some interview and uh, which is a uh, uh, job of 8000 rupees per day contact using this link and uh, towards the end it's written there that uh, your sbi account will be closed if you don't update your pan number click on this link so there are even though these fraud messages may seem very apparent to you that uh, you know that they are fraud and you should not get fall into it it is a daily business for the fraudsters how many of you uh, have seen that uh, web series jamtara 
Yes. So you can see the kind of innovative methods they use to, you know, dupe the, you know, unsuspecting customer. So there are various do's and don'ts for electronic transactions, especially among uh, the people who are using digital transactions quite frequently. So, and uh, they, these are things which you should use in a general, uh, in your general life, not just for financial transactions, but because financial transactions, they deal with your life savings, you should take more, more, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, concern and safety about them. So one is that whenever you go into a uh, banking website, you should always ensure that the uh, prefix of the website is HTTPS. The S is important here. Most websites have HTTP. So HTTPS is the additional uh, security protocol. It's S stands for secure itself. And whenever you click on it, it will say connection is secure. It uses a higher bit encryption from the normal 562. It uses 128 bit encryption. So it becomes that much more difficult for the fraudster to access the information, whatever is flowing in the, in the uh, back end. So uh, uh, another common, uh, you know, uh, advice is given is that you should keep your passwords uh, uh, difficult to guess. But that's again one thing which is easy to say in, in theory, but in practice, generally what we do is we keep the same password for everything, and we keep a very easy password which any you know experienced hacker can guess in a, within a few uh, minutes with a you know brute force uh, using a brute force technique. So especially I would recommend all of you that uh, for at least for your uh, banking uh, uh, apps and uh, websites, you use a different password for each and every app and uh, try to create some, some uh, you know, um, um, uh, phrase or something uh, which, you can, which only you would know. So that which should be difficult for anyone else. No, you should not use public uh, knowledge. You should not use your, like say, mother's name, wife's name, uh, date of birth. These things are public knowledge. Somewhere or the other, uh, people will get to know. So know something which you uh, create a password with information which only you would know. That's a general advice one can give. And make sure that you change the passwords frequently. So in case, what happens is generally that the password, the hacker will get your password and he will not use it, use it immediately. He will use it maybe after three months, six months, so that you will not be able to even trace key, when did this breach occur. So in case such a thing also happens, because you've changed your password, uh, so the password which the hacker has gotten effectively becomes useless. So always update your payment apps with the latest version so that the security is updated. And uh, link your uh, mobile phone and email ID with your uh, bank account. So ensure that, so whenever, so banks are mandated as per RBI guidelines to send you information, send you SMS for every uh, activity that happens in your, uh, in your bank account. Every credit, every debit, every time you log in, every time the password is changed. So all these things, a message is given to you. And it's important that you read these messages as well. But generally, it's common practice that uh, uh, we get so many messages from banks and some of them are ad, some of them are asking you for loans, some of them are your transaction history. So we tend to ignore them. But this is not a good practice for a, for a you know, aware customer because this is the only way through which the bank is informing you what is happening in your account. So I would request that you create some sort of system generally, maybe you know, after getting up in the morning or just before going to sleep, you quickly uh, go through the SMSs of the bank and ensure that whatever is, uh, transaction has happened has happened with your knowledge or with your authority. Any unauthorized transaction, you please make a note of it and I'll tell you the procedure for which, uh, which you can uh, take. So the don'ts which are there is never access your bank website through online search. This is again a very common uh, practice which is uh, employed by hackers. So using search engine optimization, so whenever you uh, use Google to type in a bank account, uh, by any bank name, say SBI, HDFC, ICICI. So what happens is these, bank, uh, these hackers using search engine optimization, they will ensure that their fake website is the top result. So you'll click on it and uh, unfortunately you'll be directed to the fa fake website and it'll look and uh, feel exactly the same as the original website. But only if you, uh, you have to notice very, you know, minutely where ICICI bank is, it maybe ICLCI, something will be there which you'll not be able to notice in a quick glance. So it is very uh, 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 crucial that you uh, type the website name on your own using the HTTPS uh, prefix and not uh, trust the Google uh, search results. Even for the customer care number, what happens generally any uh, false transaction happens, you would uh, just type the customer care number of the bank that the first result will come. Again, the same thing, hackers will exploit this uh, loophole and you will call the number which the hacker wants you to call, not the actual customer care number. So the details which you'll get as part of the bank account details, uh, it will be clearly mentioned where the, your customer care number is, what is the email which you have to, uh, to uh, talk to. So then you uh, please make a note of it somewhere. And so whenever any, uh, any uh, adverse uh, transaction does happen, you can contact them directly. So, and this never share your mobile banking pin, internet banking password. This has been, this is, uh, 
said throughout everywhere, I think some of the ads which are very well, actually well made by FPS, especially that uh, Munna Bhai circuit video, it's a very nice uh, ad. Uh, so so uh, if, are these in the public, if they're in the public domain, we can use them for our, uh, uh, our sessions also. Sir. Yes, so they, they are very, uh, this is a very important uh, uh, practice, but unfortunately the, all these people have been, uh, you know, uh, duped because of this reason, because they've shared some information which was meant for them, which was authorized information for them, for their use only. That was shared uh, to the, to the um, fraudster. So how do you recognize? So, so in, even in one of these ads, some person has called key, you know, share your KYC details. It's a very uh, uh, difficult to distinguish who is a fraudster, who is an actual bank employee by, by, the, uh, by just the voice or just, you know, by seeing online on these links. How, do you, how will you actually identify? Because, see, if anyone's seen the Jamtara show, they will know that hackers, they're always 10 steps ahead of us. Yes, sir. जो फ्रॉड ऑनलाइन होता है इसको रोकने के लिए आरबीआई क्या कर रहा है हां सर आई विल जस्ट टेल यू अबाउट दैट यस आई विल जस्ट टेल यू क्योंकि कोई ऐसी रिस्ट्रिक्शन तो होनी चाहिए कि 2 लाख से अबव ट्रांजैक्शन ऑनलाइन अगर हम कर रहे हैं तो उसके लिए आर बैंक से एक बार कंफर्मेशन जरूर आए हां सर दैट्स व्हाई ओटीपी Yes, so the so, Sari agency, CBI, ho, ED, ho, sari SFI, ho, Sari agency, Kamos, wait here. So we yes, understand your so, Siparis, Chare, PMO, Siparis, I, Rashpati, Havan, Siparis, I, Minister, Siparis, I, Tavam, Kam, correct. You don't have to approach any of these authorities actually. So it's not just for two lakhs and above. Every transaction you will authorize by the OTP which is given to you whether the transaction has to happen or not. That is why it is very crucial that you read the message and the OTP is not shared. So I'll tell you actually what happens is uh, the fraudsters, they employ two, one, of, one of these two techniques. Either they will try to, you know, uh, scare you, saying that like this person got a call key, uh, your KYC is going to be uh, outdated and, you know, your account, uh, whatever your money is there, it will be uh, zapped. So all these things, they will try to, you know, uh, scare you and uh, take, your, take a decision in haste without making a call, uh, giving it a second thought. Or they will try to, you know, uh, incentivize you, they'll try to, uh, you know, um, focus on the human nature, on, on greed, saying that, you know, one plus one offer mila hai, aapko, aapko koi foreign vacation mila hai, aapko aise lottery mila hai. So, you know, in, in the, in the, uh, uh, in, in, in just quickly, you will just not even give a second thought and you'll quickly click on the link or you'll just give your information. The idea is to not, sh if anything sounds too good to be true, it is generally yes, and you should be most alert then. If anyone, I'm getting a call from someone uh, that uh, either who's, either is who's scaring you or who's you know giving you this uh, you know false uh, uh, quick get, get rich quick schemes and that sort of a thing. You should you know have a stop right there and then. And instead of giving them information, you should ask them information. One key thing which all of you maybe who are banking having bank accounts which are must be getting a message saying that no bank official will be asking your information about OTP, CVV, bank account details, uh, your internet banking person, no one will ask. If anyone is calling and asking you in the first place for this information, they'll all imply all sorts of innovative tricks such as this. But ultimately, they, will, they were dependent on you to, uh, or, or to steal the information which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, for you, for authorized for you. So until you give the information to them, the fraudster cannot, uh, uh, you know, uh, undertake the fraud. So ensure that you will not uh, leak your uh, CVB, OTP to anyone. And if anyone is asking, is definitely, you know, have it with malified intentions, ask who they are. Note down their details. So there is a national cybercrime helpline called 155-260. 155-260. On this, you can uh, give the details of the SMS or your, uh, you know, the uh, phone number which you've gotten the fraud from, and the authorities will take action against them. So uh, then regarding this, uh, uh, any, any unauthorized transaction that occurs from your bank account. So in case you have given your details, then it is a fault on your side and it is difficult to uh, take any action for the, uh, uh, for the uh, transaction which have happened until you've made a complaint. So the, the rule is uh, that the RBA guidelines are also very clear on this. Whenever a fraudulent transaction or an unauthorized transaction occurs, Inform the bank immediately. Do not wait. Do not uh, think that I should approach somebody else. I should approach the police. I should approach the cybercrime people. First, inform the bank that uh, so and so. And how will you do that? 
you will be doing that through the SMS that you received. So it just becomes crucial to check your SMSs every day and to see whether any fraudulent transaction has happened or not. Once you know that a transaction has happened, give the reference of that uh, SMS to uh, on the email or the customer care number or anywhere. Get an acknowledgement that your receipt, has, uh, your complaint has been received. Because if you make a complaint within three days of the transaction occurring, there is no liability for your for the unauthorized transaction. You will not pay any loss for that for that unauthorized transaction. Provide the, provided that you have followed all the rules. If you have not shared information anywhere, if you have uh, uh, you know uh, taken care of all the do's and don'ts of electronic transactions, then if it's a fault in the system, somebody else has made a mistake, then uh, this limited liability will be applying to it. So again, again, we'll be stressing again and again that do not share your CVV, OTP, password because bank will not be able to differentiate between a fraudster or you, they will only see the OTP, where it is coming from. Once the OTP is given, it is, uh, they assume that it is uh, the authorized person has given the consent for the transaction and the transaction will un uh, undertake. So within, yes? Uh, this is not exactly related to this, uh, but I would like to share an experience. Uh, this happened to us. Uh, we were doing some work. So uh, my father got a call um, where he was uh, told that uh, you took a loan from us uh, and uh, yeah so uh, you took a loan from us and you paid the uh, EMIs for the first two installments and then you didn't so my father said that uh, no I didn't uh, ask for any lo any such loan I didn't uh, apply for any such loan so he's uh, then he uh, showed a picture he sent a picture that uh, this isn't this your picture? Aren't these your details? Hmm. So uh, my father said yes, but then he was like, uh, "So you did, you uh, did file for uh, a loan." So my father said, "No, I didn't." And uh, so he was like, "Then uh, default will be done. Your credit score, civil score, whatever it is, will So my father said, "Let it be." So at that time, uh, he said, "Okay, fine." And then after a few days, I guess my father got a notification that the civil score has uh, deteriorated or something like that. Uh, so like, how do we, uh, even if he didn't uh, share any such information, uh, it's getting affected, right? So did you check your civil score after that? Yeah, yeah. The civil report that comes. Yeah. So in the report, there is the, the loans which you have taken are clearly mentioned. Hmm. So okay. if, if the loan, which w whatever the person was referring to, which your father said he had not taken, was that mentioned or not mentioned? Yeah, it was mentioned. So then you're basically given a consent for a loan which you did not want. So, so what happens generally is in these uh, you know digital apps or even when you're going to the bank, you uh, there are a lot of forms which one has to sign, a lot of uh, 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 this uh, you know terms and conditions that one needs to give assent to. So one has to read them very carefully whether you're signing up for something which you actually wanted or any mis-selling has happened. But actually, the banks that were mentioned over there, those uh, those banks uh, are not. Then you have to take it up with the Sibyl. Ki they should update your uh, Sibyl report with the correct uh, details because from wherever the, the Sibyl report is not showing your correct, reflecting your correct uh, position. So uh, we filed a so cyber uh, complaint with the cyber crime. No, Sibyl, ka, I'll just tell you actually because it's a recent development. Uh, Sibyl is also now under the RBI Ombudsman scheme. So I'll just tell you about that, how to go about it. Okay. So yes, so any, uh, no, yes ma'am. Same thing happened with me as well. So uh, my mother got fraud for like around first there's a message for like 50,000 which is above the limit. But then with, without sharing any OTP, without sharing any personal details, around 27,000 got uh, deducted from my mother's account. Even after complaining with the RBI within like half an hour, they're still not returning. And secondly, the charging interest monthly and they're increasing the rate of interest Yes, on that. actually, but the thing is, you're supposed to uh, complain to the bank first. RBI no, is not the first. we did complain to uh, the yeah. bank first, then we complain to the RBI, we mail the RBI, yeah. we mail the SMS, everything done. But they're not returning the money, and secondly, they're saying that, uh, again, your civil, sco civil score will be reduced and everything, and they're charging interest on it. Has the award already been uh, uh, done to the party? Matlab, has uh, Ombudsman given something in writing to them? He's saying they return the money, you don't return the money? No, they've been, uh, like, informative, they've been, uh, my mother's been communicating with the bank, but they're not, uh, but no, they're if calling. If you file with the RBI, your status will be there on the portal, right? Well, what is the status reflecting right now? Um, 
not really sure of that. Uh, so the status, once uh, if they find uh, you know uh, that a fraud has happened, then they, uh, the bank is obligated to give you money. Otherwise, a hefty penalty is put on them. So that also will go to you and for in mental comp future cost of it. Like if they're not returning the money and they're charging interest. No, but on uh, it, if so the if the RBI has said them to uh, return the money and they're not doing, then you tell the, uh, again in the same complaint you add an error in the complaint the money has not been returned to us. So then uh, action will be taken against them. With you will get a higher amount. Thank you. So yeah. So I think I'll uh, I'm just running out of time. I'll take uh, the questions towards the end if there's time remaining. So uh, most of these, I think, are pertaining to the banking ombudsman, which I'll be just talking about uh, towards the end. So I think most of your qu queries will be addressed. So yes, the RBI integrated ombudsman scheme. So this was also launched as part of the um, uh, two schemes which, uh, by the Honorable Prime Minister in November 2021. So earlier, what happened is that uh, there were ombudsman schemes for different uh, entities, such as banks, NBFCs, uh, payment systems. So, and also the jurisdiction of all the uh, ombudsman was limited to the region. Suppose you are in Chennai, but you have a bank account in Lucknow, and the fraud has happened in Lucknow, you'll have to file with uh, RBI uh, Lucknow, uh, all the way from Chennai. So now, no such thing exists. There is a one, under this one nation, one ombudsman, there is one portal, one email, and one address uh, for all your banking complaints, whether they pertain to banks, NBFCs, or even the, uh, uh, the payment system operators. So uh, the, there's no longer uh, any, uh, it's necessary, it's no longer necessary for the complainant to identify which scheme should you complain to. All complaints uh, can be put under this uh, um, ombudsman scheme. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I would like to share my experience in the same context that they have been telling me. And it just so happened that I was in the process of settling an electricity bill on a, a UT, whatever the, this thing was. Uh, yeah, this is, this is, is a recent fraud which has come to our attention also, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, and I just wanted to share such a positive experience that I had with the RBI ombudsman and I have been able to get all my money back. So okay. I just wanted to highlight for those of you who are still feeling very frustrated about not being able to reach out and not recovering the money, that it happens. And the one more thing that has happened, I had filed in as a police complaint, and the department that uh, he, he mentioned about uh, the police uh, directorate looking into this, I got a call from them saying that they were able to actually trace two of those numbers from which this whole fraud has happened and they have been able to file a police complaint against them. There's a court case now going on and it's only a matter of time before they get a judgment on that. So I just wanted to share with all of you saying that yes, there is hope if that's Thank what you, so much, you would you. like to see. Thank you, Madam. So uh, the salient features I was talking about the integrated ombudsman scheme. So there's uh, another thing is there's a specified list of exclusions now. So earlier in, under the previous schemes, there were certain categories on which the complaint could be filed, and uh, beyond those uh, complaints, beyond those which were mentioned in the list. Uh, the uh, bank was not obligated to, uh, you know, uh, entertain your complaint. So now we have reversed it. Now all complaints relating to any deficiency in service, uh, whether an act of omission or remission, they, they uh, are under the uh, ombudsman scheme. So only there is a specified list of exclusion, which I'll just share with you in the next slide. So it's also done away with the jurisdiction of each ombudsman scheme. And you can file the complaint in any form, in through the portal, which is cms.rbi.org.in through email, which is crpc.rbi.org.in, and through the physical mode, which uh, goes to a centralized uh, processing center at Chandigarh. So uh, regarding this point, I think which ma'am was mentioning here, uh, the regulated entity does not have the right to appeal in cases where award issued against it for not furnishing sa satisfactory and timely information. So they're obligated to furnish the information to take action in a timely manner. Otherwise, they will not have a uh, uh, you know, right to appeal. So the complaints which don't fall under the ombudsman scheme are there just these uh, eight complaints, types of complaints which don't fall under the ombudsman scheme. Remaining everything falls under the ombudsman scheme. So they are basically not pertaining to customer facing uh, aspects of the bank, 
basically commercial judgment uh, and any decision of the entity, a dispute between a vendor and a regulated entity for an outsourcing contract, a grievance not directly addressed to the ombudsman. So this is again a very key point. Any complaint, especially if you're giving in a physical form, has to be given to the ombudsman uh, of RBI. RBI ombudsman, CRPC, Chandigarh, the address I'll be just sharing with you in a bit. Any, any service which is not under the regulatory purview of Reserve Bank of India, any you know, HR issue between the regulated entity. So these are the very limited uh, uh, um, grounds on which the complaint is not entertained. So the procedure for filing a complaint. So first thing anyone who has, has faced an issue has to inform the bank. If the bank doesn't give a satisfactory reply within 30 days, then you can go log on to cms.rbi.org.in. This is the banking ombudsman portal of RBI. So they, it is completely free of cost. You don't have to go through anyone. In fact, if you give your complaint through anyone, maybe through an, through an advocate or something, the complaint is rejected. So the affected party directly has to complain uh, on this, uh, on this uh, um, uh, 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 banking ombudsman portal, which is https cms.rbi.org.in. Email you can do at crpc.rbi.org.in. And the physical address is also given. Physical address, please ensure that you're writing to the ombudsman of uh, RBI. So uh, previously, when the old, under the old scheme, there were uh, uh, certain things which did not fall under the purview of uh, the ombudsman scheme, they, for, for which there was a uh, cell created called the Consumer Education and Protection Cell, CEPC. So they were created to monitor and take action on all complaints which don't fall under the ambit of uh, the erstwhile banking ombudsman scheme. The categories for which they are listed now uh, are given here, the six categories. Important thing to note here, the, why I included this here, is because like we're complaining and getting a lot of complaints from uh, this credit information company such as uh, Sybil. So now Sybil also has been moved under the uh, integrated ombudsman scheme, which is a new scheme. So earlier Sybil was part of this uh, the CEPC framework, but now uh, uh, credit information companies fall under the integrated ombudsman uh, scheme. So basically it's uh, all India financial institutions, NBFC such as investment companies, infrastructure companies, non-scheduled uh, urban cooperative banks with less than 50 crores, they fall under the, uh, the uh, CPC ambit. Another initiative which was taken under CPC, so uh, there is an internal ombudsman for all the regulated entities like banks, non-bank system participants such as PPIs, prepaid in, uh, in, uh, instruments, and uh, for non-banking financial uh, companies. So what happens is it's an independent company within the bank. So once bank uh, processes your complaint and if, uh, suppose it does not entertain it, either it rejects the complaint or partially accepts it. So the, those such complaints go to the internal ombudsman of the bank, which is an independent entity, and they evaluate whether the bank has taken the right decision or not. So, there is, so that's why we're supposed to give them 30 days so that they can uh, uh, undergo this process. There's also a charter of uh, customer rights, such as right to fair treatment, right to transparency, fair and honest dealing, right to suitability. Suitability is a very important thing. Uh, what happens is ki generally an unsuspecting customer who goes to a bank or any, any, any financial institution, there's this tendency by the agent there to cross sell you, miss sell you products for their own benefit. So you go there for insurance, but instead of sending you term insurance, they'll sell you something uh, insurance plus investment scheme for which the premiums are much higher and which is not suitable to you. So ensure that when the person is telling you a product, ask whether it, what is relevant to me, you apply your own judgment whether it's relevant to me or not. So the right to suitability is also a right for the customer. Right to privacy, your details cannot be shared with uh, any third party without your consent. Right to grievances, redress, and compensation under the ombudsman schemes. So this was basically about the uh, financial literacy to the common man aspect. Uh, but since there are many college stu students here, I included a few slides on MSME and startups. So to address the uh, this. Uh, uh, financial need for for the up and uh, upcoming uh, startups there is this priority sector lending which uh, occurs uh, under rbi uh, the rbi framework so priority sector uh, lending is a very old concept by rbi basically to uh, uh, channel credit to underserved but uh, deserve underserved but deserving uh, sectors of the economy yeah. so such as agriculture msme export credit housing that sort of a thing so under those uh, under this uh, framework 40% of the net bank credit uh, has to be flowing to these sectors. So under this, a special target has been given to micro enterprises, which is the smallest uh, segment of the MSME sector, which is having, uh, in the slide here, you can see in the bottom left, 
micro enterprises, those inter uh, enterprises having investment in plant and machinery less than one crore, and annual turnover of less than uh, five crore. So any new startup will start as a, as a micro enterprise. So for them, a special uh, target of 7.5% of the net bank credit has been given. So banks are mandated to give this much, at minimum this much uh, uh, credit to the micro sectors. And also loans to startups up to 50 rupees crores has been recently included in the PSL guidelines. So uh, I've included why, what is the definition of MSME and startup here? It's given here micro, small and medium. And startup is given to us the right that it has to be a private limited company or LLP or partnership firm, which is uh, up to 10 years of date of incorporation. So every new company uh, will not be a startup. A startup has a certain definition which is given by the Ministry of Commerce and uh, Industry. So, uh, Shrikant, uh, I hate to intervene. It's such a nice presentation, but uh, we are running out of oh, time. So, sorry, so if you, no, 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 no. I fully understand, but uh, unfortunately, Madam has to leave oh, also. No, sorry, sir, yeah. And uh, so, if you can wind up in yeah. five minutes, I'll just minutes, give the last. Yeah. I want yeah. to tell the benefits of the loan. It's it's really very yeah. very so nice. Presentation. Uh, quickly, I'll try to uh, tell about the benefits that accrue to MSMEs and startups. For MSMEs, you'll have to register under a portal called udyamregistration.gov.in. With MSME, you'll get a certificate like mentioned uh, here. And for Startup India, you'll have to register under startupindia.gov.in. Once you're registered, you'll be eligible for the benefits uh, which accrue to you. So you can take a collateral fee loan of up to 10 lakh rupees under MSME, under this Mudra loan scheme, for under three categories of Shishu, Kishor, and Tarun. And you can also, for SCST women borrowers, you can also enroll under Stand Up India scheme where you can get a benefit of uh, uh, one crore, a loan up to one crore rupees. Yeah. So lastly, I think we have included this uh, security features of banknote given to all the participants. So you can have a look at the various security features which are there, such as integral printing, race printing, fluorescence, and such. And lastly, no note refund rules. So anyone having any defective notes or mutilated notes, they can approach the bank to, uh, to get them replaced. So there are certain criteria which is given under RBI note refund rules. I can show sure you can Google it. It's very clearly given that if the undivided piece of the note is uh, uh, between uh, is less than 40 percent, then you will not get the value of it. If it's between 40 to 50, 80 percent, you'll get full uh, half value, and if it's more than 80 percent, you'll get full value of the note. So these were the things which I wanted to just share uh, to the participants. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. Excellent presentation. So like, uh, I, I think uh, this has been a learning for all of us. Uh, so uh, there are problems. We do recognize there are problems. And that is why these sessions are being arranged. And uh, that is why these outreaches are being done by Reserve Bank also and other regulators uh, uh, in trying to educate the public. It's, it's a hard uh, area. I mean, it uh, requires interface with the enforcement agencies. Uh, we have the uh, Delhi Cybercrime Unit head coming uh, in the afternoon. So we'll discuss more. We, we are trying our best to resolve. So please be patient with what happens. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I think there is one very important uh, thing which is now uh, to be un, uh, uh, sort of unveiled and uh, then uh, we unfortunately Mr. Uh, uh, Madam Akela as well as Shrikant have to leave for office work so uh, but Kushi is here before you leave so uh, so can we go ahead with the mascot thing? I hope that all of you participate in this uh, mascot. As you would have seen the RBI clips, it had a nice uh, mascot of a rupee which was wound around a person. So this is something similar we are looking for IPFA also, something which uh, should go to people that and identify IPFA with it. So I expect participation in huge numbers. We have prizes also. So I wish you all the best. Uh, please carry on. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Uh,
Madam, uh, thanks for coming here, and we very much appreciate your involvement on this important day. I know there are other events also, uh, so uh, thanks. I'm sure you'll all gain a lot, so please do carry on. Thank you. Thanks, madam. Very much appreciate you getting in touch with you. Thank you. Uh, so now, uh, we have an awareness session for common men on investor protection. This was financial literacy, financial inclusion sort of uh, presentation. And uh, the IPFA, uh, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, will now do the awareness for the investor protection. A very good afternoon to all. Uh, so basically my session is about IPFA and investors, journey mandates and processes. But just digressing from the topic, like as was evident in the first session that one of the main object objectives of IPFA is to make the refund of unclaimed shares and dividends which comes to us. So let us understand what is this problem of unclaimed and unpaid assets. So can anyone tell me that what type of assets one can hold? Somebody can pass on the mic. Anybody that what are the different categories of asset we can hold? Uh, basically, you can have two type of assets if we have a bifurcation at very macro level, movable and immovable assets. Then in movable assets, you can hold financial assets and non-financial assets. So suppose somebody holds an asset and the person has died. So how his legal heir will get hold of that asset? Anyone? Nomination. Very good. So mostly what we do right now is we have a nomination in all our financial assets, be it shares, be it FD, be it our saving bank account, be it be our PPF. Now in case of immovable assets, Suppose how many of you, your parents will be holding an um, immovable asset, probably a house or um, a house or a garage or a business. How will, suppose something happens to him or her, how will that be transferred to you or your siblings? Will. So one of the process which is, which can be done during the lifetime of a person is a will, you can write a will to bequeath your asset to your legal heirs to have a sanctity, legal sanctity of that will so that it get executed without any legal problem. You need to get it registered. The registration can be done at the sub-registrar office like you do for normal deeds. So basically what we promote is that the asset in case of IPFA, that is dividend and share, should, should not come to us first. There should not be any unclaimed asset. There are other organizations like 
the person from RBI was there. Suppose we speak about fixed deposits or saving bank accounts. If you don't do any transactions on those FD or saving bank accounts for more than 10 years, it goes to an RBI-owned fund called DEF. So you can claim it from the bank account. Similar is the role for IPFA. If you have not claimed dividend on shares for more than seven years, seven years is a consecutive period, then these get transferred to IPFA. How can you avoid your dividends or shares getting transferred to IPFA or to some other body? So these days, whenever you purchase shares, you have to purchase them in DMAT form. You buy it from the secondary market or you buy it from the primary market through IPOs. So DMAT has been made mandatory. And in DMAT, if you don't want to have a nomination, you have to fill a specific opt-out form. Otherwise, in all cases, you have to have a mandatory nomination. Similarly, when you go for opening a bank account or you go for opening an FD, the person or the bank person will mandatorily ask for you for the nomination. If you don't want to have a nomination, you have to have a special tick mark that I don't want a particular nomination. This has been done so that in future, this asset does not become unclaimed or unpaid. Now, going ahead with the mandatory functions which IPFA is conceived to do, one of that is investor education. Now, the outcome of investor education is improved financial capability. When we define financial capability, we say that the person should have understanding, should have the understanding of digesting information, instructions, and objective advice about financial things. He should develop skill and confidence. He should be aware. He should make informed choices and effective actions for his or her own financial well-being. That is why at the start I told that if you have any asset or your father or somebody in your family is having any asset, whether it be financial asset or non-financial asset, movable asset or immovable asset, you should first understand that if some something happens to the person holding that asset, what will happen to that asset? So you should plan nomination or you should plan that in worst case, through a will, it can be transferred to the legal heir. Suppose in case there is no will, then you have to go for succession you will have to go for succession. Obtaining succession is a bit lengthy process, which is done through a court mandated process. I will skip the part of um, like IPFA, like what does IPF does, because I think it will be covered in the next session or it has been partly, like you have been ignited enough to Google about IPFA. So suppose, you have an unclaimed shares or unpaid shares. How will you come to know that these shares have been transferred to IPFA? Anyone? How will you come to know? Suppose if you have physical share certificate, like our CEO was saying that if you hold a physical share certificate, you cannot transfer it. You, can, you cannot use it for exchange or you cannot get money out of transferring their shares. So what will you do? Suppose you find some physical share certificate at your home. How will you come to know that what to do of the, those shares? Yes. You, so, 
suppose you have physical share certificates. So the basic thing first you have to do is you have to check that whether the company is existing or is has been liquidated or has been struck off. So you can Google about the company and the company status. Suppose it's a company which is active. You can approach that company to make those shares demated and transfer it to, into your DMAT account. So first step would be that you need to open a DMAT account. You need to open a DMAT account with a depository participant. Most of the banks like State Bank of India, ICICI or other major banks also have a wing called depository participants. So you need to open a DMAT account with one of those DMAT, uh, depository participants. The other which are, uh, which are popular, which we call at discount brokers also, like Zerodha is there, Sheikh Khan is there. So you can raise a request to demag those physical shares with those depository participants. And the process is called DMAT request, DRF form. So once you raise that request, you will come to know that either this will be demated and will be transferred to your DMAT account, or the company will provide you a reason why it cannot be demated. The company can also tell you that because you have not transferred, you have not claimed the dividends on those shares for more than seven years, those have been transferred to IEPFA. So one of the way of knowing that these shares have been transferred to IPFA is through the company. The second way is that you can go on the website of IPFA and there is a facility called search unclaimed and unpaid amount. You can also search your dividends or shares which have been transferred to IPFA through this facility. For this, using this facility, you need to have the investor name, the father name or the husband name, folio number or DMAT ID through which you were maintaining those shares with you. If you have all those information, then this facility will also come to your rescue if you want to know that these shares have been transferred to IPFA or not. So the takeaways for this is that if you have any physical shares or physical certificates of bonds, you need to do two things. First is try to get it demetted as soon as possible and make sure that you have nomination in those. The benefit will be that if something happens to the original holders, the nominee will get it easily and without much process. Second thing is that suppose if these shares or dividends have been transferred to IPFA, how can you claim it back? The claim process is online. You need to file a web form from IPF5, which is available on our website ipf.gov.in. You need to register on the website and you need to file the form IEPF 5. The form as well as the documents which are required are enumerated in the form itself which needs to be sent to the company through its nodal officer. The nodal officer's list is also pro provided on the website of IEPFA. Once you send all those documents, nodal officer will verify your claim and that will be transferred to IPFA who on verifying the nodal officer's verification report will transfer the D shares in the DMAT account of the claimant and the money in the bank account. So whatever comes to us is refunded through our DMAT process. Coming back to cases where the original holder has died and the legal heir is claiming. As discussed earlier, that in case 
there is a nomination, that process will become easier. Or if there is a registered will, that can be taken for transferring or transmission of those shares and dividends to the legal heir who will be the claimant. But in case there is no nomination, there is no will, there is no registered will, the person has to obtain a succession certificate in case where value of shares is more than 5 lakhs. The person has to go to the court and obtain a valid succession certificate from the court before filing the claim with IPF authority. Once the claim is approved, it will take some time to transfer those shares and dividend to your bank account. The key takeaways for IPFA claim process is that the filing of IPFA form is a simple online and it does not require any professional help. The help kit of IPF5 web form is very much available. The company is required to verify the form and the details will therein within 30 days. Any discrepancy or documents requirement which the authority will have will be provided through an email. The email mentioned in the IPF form should be of the claimant himself or herself so that he may receive all the documentation requirement which the IPF authority may raise from time to time. Authority is endeavoring to process all claims within 60 days of filing of e-verification report by the company. The claimants can track the status of their claims through website. Once claim is approved, the shares, as I told, that will be transferred in the DMAT form and the amount will be transferred to the bank account. The entire process is faceless. That is, you never know that who will be dealing with your case, and it follows FIFO method. Claimants are not required to physically visit the office of the authority, and any such visit is advised to be avoided. Now, coming back to the unclaimed and un unpaid assets, can anybody tell me that we have talk about unclaimed shares and unclaimed amount. What all financial assets can also be unclaimed, other than shares and dividend? Have you heard about unclaimed PPF? So where does uh, the unclaimed PPF goes? Unclaimed PPF is transferred to a fund called Senior Citizen Welfare Fund, which the government utilizes for the welfare of senior citizens. It can also be claimed back. So there are various financial assets other than shares and dividends, which are also lying unclaimed, like, as I told, the FD bank accounts are with the RBI. Then there are mutual funds, which are also unclaimed. You can go with to your mutual fund holder, like if you have with Reliance Capital or if you have with the SBI mutual fund, and you have to do the same process. That is, if you have done the nomination, you can, by the virtue of nomination, claim it back. But if you have not done the nomination, then you will have to prove that you are entitled to it. That is why in all our investor awareness programs, we focus that in future, all financial assets should be maintained digitally with a proper nomination. Our tagline is that we, we want uh, uh, all our citizens to become an informed and invest, uh, empowered investors. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. 
it has been rightly said that there is no such thing as free lunch. We all have seen canopies or camps around the roads, wherein a guy from a bank or an insurance company is explaining loopholes of the prevalent financial products to general public. Or perhaps, you must have seen a TV commercial with some financial awareness <laughs> message having a tagline towards the end which says, Janit Me Jari, issued in public interest. But are they really generous enough to raise lakhs of rupees or probably crores in TV commercials for the sake of public awareness only? Are they actually? Well, the answer to the question is a big no. As this is not uncommon to find these banks, insurance companies, or other financial institutions pitching for some of their products towards the end, explaining the added features provided by their respective companies to sell. It is almost like a situation where the writer emphasizes what's in the name, but at the end, it clearly states writer Shakespeare's uh, to get the credit. So you might be thinking, what exactly do I want to indicate, right? I here want to say uh, a few words regarding the organizations that uh, you, are, you have been listening about. See, in my opinion, such an ironical situation of financial awareness being compromised for vested interests only must have been noticed by the government at a higher level, which eventually led to the proposal to spread true financial literacy without any hidden agenda throughout the country, the country where we have almost 74% people who are literate, but where we have 77% people who are financially illit illiterate. That is why it was decided to establish the only authority of its kind, and that is the Investor Awareness and Protection Fund Authority with a dedicated mandate not only to make every citizen of the country financially educated regarding savings, budgetings, uh, budgeting and investments, but also to spread awareness against lucrative but fraudulent schemes, stealing hard-earned money of crores, even uh, in many cases for highly educated people. Therefore, IPFA, since its inception, has adopted multi-pronged strategies for its uh, investor awareness programs. The authority, with its only office in Delhi, without any subsidiary or regional branch, and that too with handful of officers, to be very precise, 12, decided to rope in other organizations with on-ground reach to last mile. It conducts programs in rural areas through Common Service Center as CSC. The CSC has around 5 lakh centers throughout the country, and it has a good connect with people of different backgrounds, languages, and financial interests. In semi-urban areas, Indian Post Payment Bank, with its trained and certified Grameen Dark Sevaks, they are providing financial literacy with its trained and certified uh, Gram Sevaks, uh, Grameen Dark Sevaks with a door-to-door -door program for financial inclusion. Nehru Yuva Kendra, that is one of the organizations we are associated with, has also been tasked to reach its uniqueness, the country's youth with the overall objective of making them familiar with their rights and further encouraging them to spread this knowledge as a volunteer. So it's a binary kind of effect for their expertise that they can actually forward uh, to other people around them. But this time, this binary effect is for protection, unlike the one as binary chain system in some Ponzi schemes. In urban areas too, certified and reliable professionals of ICAI and ICSI are educating the educated ones but this time for financial literacy. Dedicated handbooks, brochures, short films, and other such material has been prepared for uniform and effective dissemination of knowledge. However, the resource person further modify the same based on the target audience and their needs. So IPFA was established in 2016 only. More than 45,000 ground awareness programs had already been conducted till March 2020. It was a time when COVID-19 shattered all the contact programs and on-ground activities badly. Still, adapting to the changing times and to maintain the pace of the activities, these, uh, these physical programs were shifted to the webinar mode. And number of states or national level webinars were organized in Pan-India, especially focusing on increasing cyber crimes and digital frauds during the pandemic time. Now the programs are back as restrictions have been lifted. As a result, I'm proud to announce on this sixth foundation day of IPFA 
that even after two long years of COVID restrictions in between last six years of IPFA existence, IPFA with our partner organizations could manage to conduct more than 67,000 IPs on ground, spreading awareness uh, to around 30 lakh people in almost every part of the country. These include programs in vicinity and door-to-door -door campaigns as well. In addition to IPs, various activities are also being conducted through digital modes like All India Radio, Prasar Bharti, Sunset TV, Doordarshan, and Ignu Gyan Darshan. Dedicated investor talk shows named as Vartha Shankla, tele-lecturing series through experts on various investment-centric topics, scroll messages for awareness regarding budgeting and against fraudulent schemes are also being run. In, uh, in fact, segment-centric TV commercials have also been aired. A few you must have noticed in the morning here on the uh, screen in the hall. Multi-language jingles uh, were loved and appreciated by a large section of rural uh, area on FM and All India Radio. Quarterly, newspaper notices are also being issued to invite rightful claimants for their, uh, their claim settlement and to spread other messages based on IPFA mandate. In fact, one of the public notices by IPFA may also be seen in all leading newspapers today itself. Another feather in IPFA's cap has been development of the IPFA mobile app that is there with NISG. Though it is in the very initial stage, it is a remarkable initiative towards prompt citizen service in digital mode and an effort to ensure strong grievance redressal system. The app was launched by the Honorable uh, Finance Minister on March 25, 2021. It has interactive features related to investor awareness, IEC material, claim fund tracking. In fact, uh, the way Gaurav sir said, you can check your claim status uh, on this app itself, and a learning management system that is being further enhanced. In addition, social media is also being actively used to reach out to stakeholders through digital platforms for citizen uh, engagement, awareness, and grievance management. The response has been really good, especially in last one year. IPFA has also collaborated with various banks, with Bank of Baroda, like uh, Kotek, Kotek Mahindra Bank, ICICI Bank, for the co-branding of various collaterals in print and digital channels of these institutes. These collaborations are a step towards awakening people for their financial transaction in a zone where these transactions are actually taking place. For promoting research in the field, in fact, we have two uh, IPF research chairs. These were also made functional at ISEA and with NCEA respectively. The chairs analyze and review economic, legal, and regulatory issues at the uh, root of the problem in investor education and protection. They further develop knowledge products, case studies, research articles, and seminars on topics related to investor education and protection. In fact, today when we are here at NCAER with this uh, beautiful audience, we are thankful to our research chair, Dr. Midul Sagar, for this, that he could manage to arrange uh, such you know, things uh, on a very short notice for IPFA. And in fact, uh, now I would like to sum up my words with a quote from Abraham Lincoln. He says, in the end, it's not the years in your life that count. It's the life in your years. I must say IPFA, IPFA has lived these lines by doing so well in last six years and will keep adding to it in next coming years too. So thank you all for your time. Now uh, I would like to request uh, Dr. Sagar to take the lead further with his work for IPFA regarding several dimensions of investor uh, education and protection. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sumit Agarwal and also Gaurav Gupta. I mean, this has been uh, an excellent uh, sort of a, a presentation to make people aware of what IPFA does and has contributed. Uh, it's a very hard work they are doing with very limited staff. And uh, please, uh, so uh, uh, give them a big hand. Uh, so they both have done like, wonderful things. Uh, uh, these these small small things which are done turns into a very big thing actually and uh, that's how the financial system goes uh, i don't have much to say to this audience but uh, maybe uh, i'll raise some big picture issues uh, with uh, the audience i don't know uh, th this is 
because already all technical details have been discussed. So I will uh, basically speak from the policy point of view in a short time. Okay, uh, so I will be, as uh, you've already been told, I'll be talking about uh, different dimensions of investor protection and give you a quick sweep of policies and practices and what can be done uh, ahead uh, from the policy point of view. So let me just start with basic macroeconomics here. Uh, why investment protection is important. And uh, it's a lot to do because saving and investment rates are the key drivers of growth in an economy. So if you want the well-being, then obviously you have to focus on saving and investment issues. Uh, so there is enormous theory and empiricism which shows that saving and investment actually drive economic growth. Uh, the causality is still very hard debated among economists whether it is uh, the investments which drive the growth or is it the growth which drive the investment and actually uh, probably it's bi-directional. Uh, Carol and Vail and others talk that uh, it's uh, uh, the economic growth that promotes saving and not vice versa but there's enough evidence on the other side also, which shows that actually uh, it is investment uh, and saving and investment, the difference is just your what you is your current account deficit. I don't know whether all of you understand that or not, but investment rate will be higher than saving rate if you run the current account deficit and it will be lower if you run a current account surplus. So that's how things are done. Uh, there is uh, uh, the notion that investment causes growth is inherent in old uh, models of growth like Harrod Domer or uh, the solo models, but the more latest newer versions like the uh, endogenous growth models, uh, they have raised uh, uh, that this is, all these are endogenous and they go along with uh, variables like knowledge, capital, government spending, labor and capital productivity, very endogenously, they all together get determined. But that doesn't mean that investment doesn't matter for growth. Now, for the G20 countries, when I computed the correlation between saving and growth rates, it was uh, 0.72. And for investment and growth, it was higher at 0.83. Now, uh, but these are all high correlations. And uh, when I tried looking at what is the relationship between saving and investment, the correlation was pretty high at 0 0.86. Now, a very high correlation with saving and investment actually means that foreign inflows do not really matter. The current account gap doesn't really matter because, uh, so, so it basically means that surplus capital doesn't necessarily flow from rest of the world easily into a domestic economy because there is a home bias among people. They prefer home assets compared to foreign assets. And, but nevertheless, clearly lifting saving and investment is important for growth, and therefore we need culture of regulatory enforcement to protect the interests of savers and investments. And this is the bottom line I want to draw. Now, uh, Something has happened this week in terms of the data releases. Uh, if you see what's happening, um, and uh, um, India seems to have become the fifth largest economy in the world, overtaking the United Kingdom. Uh, so India was sixth largest economy when IMF database was released in April. Uh, in US dollar terms, I'm talking about the purchasing power parity terms, India is third largest economy. But even in the US dollar terms, it was sixth largest economy. But if you do the latest calculation convert by the exchange rate, you find that India has overtaken UK. Uh, as the UK prime minister changed, UK has lost its position and actually India has uh, overtaken them. 
so India is likely to become the fourth largest economy in 2027. It will overtake Germany as per my projections and it will become the third largest somewhere in early 2030s. So India is progressing in terms of the size of the economy, but the real challenge is that India needs to improve its living standards. India is at rock bottom in the G20 pyramid in terms of per capita income. So there's a lot to be done to push the saving and investment rates and to do more on institutional mechanisms like investment protections. So uh, I think uh, uh, convergence of per capita income among various countries is not really happening. Uh, but nevertheless, India is progressing. There are some other countries which are progressing. So uh, that is one good thing that is happening. Now, when I plotted a long time series right from the time uh, we started our planning era of how saving and investment rates have moved, one thing very stark which is happening is that actually India's saving rate after having risen 4.8 times and rising from a low of 7.9 to 37.8% of GDP has actually started falling. And it has dropped 9.6 percentage points to 28.2% of GDP in 2021. Similar trend is noticed with aggregate investment, which is also now dropping and has dropped 12.5 percentage points. Now, falling saving and investment rates are, to my mind, one of the most important factors that has dragged India's growth down. And the GVA growth has slipped from an average of 8.5% during 2003-04 to just 5% during 11-12 to 20-21. And herein lies a challenge. We have to reverse this trend, and we have to focus on how to comfort the savers and investors, and how to create a environment for a stable positive return where savers and investors can actually uh, put more save more of the funds and india can grow faster but i think what is very crucial is that we have to arrest the type of frauds and thus is a sine qua non in the thing excess returns are not the only drivers of saving and investment i think safety and stability is of paramount importance and that is what we need to do. And uh, so we have to focus. History is replete with financial frauds. We have to stop the financial frauds. There was a lot of discussion in the morning two sessions on financial frauds. So uh, there have been systemic problems, financial crisis from time to time. But there have been millions of episodes of financial frauds and bankruptcies, which we don't focus on. The main uh, financial crisis actually is often making headline news. But these uh, small frauds, bankruptcy, only work on investor protection, on corporate governance. This is where things can improve. Now, mm, uh, what I would like to submit is that the investor protection is a multi-dimensional concept. Uh, I know uh, the IEPF is doing very good work on making refund of shares, unclaimed deposits, mature deposit debentures. Uh, 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 so uh, these, these are important things, and distribution of disgorge amounts to the rightful investors. This is very, very important. And uh, uh, that is uh, the core to which things, institutional improvements will improve. But I think we need to think about this with a little broader mandate and broader vision. And I think uh, it's important to, that this goes hand in hand with issues of financial development, developing safe financial products so that they increase the menu choices for savers and investors. The fee structures which affect the intermediation costs are very important. Trading str uh, strategies, market uh, integrity, uh, risk disclosures are important, conflict of interest disclosures are important, and we need to safeguard whistleblowers and prevent pred predatory lending, you know, because uh, a, a, a small investor can be tempted with low-cost loans and get trapped to begin with, and then he finds that his debt has multiplied and he can't meet that debt, and interest rates keep fluctuating and going up. So. That's where the problem lies. 
Now, corporate governance is key to investor protection, and corporate governance is a multifaceted concept, uh, but the most I like it is that the corporate governance is about the ways in which the suppliers of finance to the corporation, that is shareholders. See, uh, we all must understand that as a shareholders, we are the owner of firms, not the Tatas or the Billas or whoever. I, this is just taking not names for any particular thing. I'm trying to say that whoever like uh, is is basically the controlling shareholder is not that important as you, a small shareholder, uh, is extremely important. So you have to see, as a shareholder, you have some rights, and you have to see that uh, you are getting returns on the, your investments, and uh, the controlling shareholders, managers, are all forced to return profits, not invest in bad projects, not steal capital, and that is the most important concept because there's a principal agent relationship here between shareholders. The shareholders don't day-to-day -day run the company. It's the management which runs the company or the controller shareholders which uh, sort of uh, uh, kind of look after. Now, corporate governance matters uh, because firms with the corporate governance structures, uh, uh, often the business family is indulged in looting, tunneling of corporate frauds. And we have to be very conscious that this is sort of checked. Uh, there was a paper by Nobel laureates uh, looting the economic word of bankruptcy of profit in the Brookings paper of economic activity in 1993 uh, over how uh, there is incentive to go broke for profits at the society's expense. And we have to stop those sort of things the tunneling, which is an unethical business practice in which majority shareholders or um, which are at a high level in a company does some insider uh, transfers of company's assets to privately owned firms and uh, they are able to sh uh, uh, shift the money. So as a small shareholder, you have to be conscious of what is happening to the firms you invest in. And that is very, very crucial. You can, firms can do cash flow tunneling, asset tunneling, equity tunneling, corporate frauds, actually to sort of uh, let uh, basically uh, the controlling shareholder benefit. And uh, so please attend your annual general meetings, raise your voice, seek information, that's your right. Now, there have been a host of scandals, uh, uh, major corporate scandals from time to time. For paucity of time, I would rather avoid discussing them. But, uh, uh, you know, all of these uh, scandals, when they come out, actually rock the company and uh, the long-term uh, interests of the companies are uh, affected uh, because their shareholder value just tumbles, you know. You, you may be holding a share and then because of these frauds, suddenly you'll find that the share you own is now just 10% of the value which existed in the market price. So a good corporate uh, governance structure is extremely important. Uh, there have been various kind of initiatives. Uh, there was a Cadbury report uh, which was uh, produced um, by Adrian Cadbury uh, Saabne's Oxley Act was there, the Dodd-Frank Act, all of them have tried in uh, the international sense to push the corporate governance. So all, uh, our regulator SEBI has been doing a lot on this front in order to uh, improve corporate governance. RBI also is uh, uh, improving corporate governance in banks. Uh, so if, if you see, like I do remember, there was hue and cry over why a uh, particular private bank's uh, chairman's term is not being extended. Uh, so the market thought he's a very market-savvy um, chairman, and for, uh, when he was not getting extended for months, there were complaints till the frauds came out, and then everyone understood. So regulators are doing their jobs. SEBI, SEBI is also doing its job. They, they had set up Kumar Mangalam Birla Committee and others. So they have pushed this to a great degree. Now, uh, the thing is, there are several dimensions, I said. While corporate governance is the key, 
One other important dimension of investor protection is financial inclusion, and we should do financial inclusion uh, where people understand the products, people are uh, uh, sort of taught financial literacy, the kind of campaigns we did along with it. As you see, we have made tremendous progress in bank account opening. So you see the right-hand side graph on how uh, the Pradhan Mantri Jan Dhan Yojana accounts have just um, uh, increased. So uh, that is extremely uh, important. And uh, uh, this success has been amazing, but we also need to think of how to take a step further so that it's not just that people have money in the, first the accounts were open, there was no money in the accounts. Now the government has uh, started doing transfers, so there is money in the bank accounts. But the banks still aren't lending to the small uh, sort of a customer. So we have to encourage that culture so that the financial inclusion is on both the deposit side and the lending side. Uh, the Reserve Bank has transferred the payment system in India by developing digital payment infrastructure. Uh, in the morning session it was talked about, so I need not really uh, uh, say in length here. Uh, so we, we, we want empowered society and the knowledge economy, and we want faceless, paperless, cashless uh, sort of digital India. Uh, it cannot ever be cashless, but less cash is fine. Like. So uh, this has been uh, created with the vision, and we have, in particular, the UPI was a game changer because that ensured interoperability. Uh, you could actually do all banking on your mobile because of UPI, and that is where the things have got changed. Uh, we are now stepping into already e is launched, uh, there's work going on on central bank digital currencies, so uh, a lot more revolution is on the card. It's just that uh, it will take a, a, a we, we are into phase two now in the sense after having a retail payment revolution. Now, have we leveraged digital technology for financial inclusion? Uh, where do we stand globally? I think to really recognize that India has made giant leaps in financial inclusion. Uh, so uh, the percentage of uh, people with 15 plus age who have a financial institution account were just 35% in 2011, and that has leapfrogged to 77% in 2021. Uh, so that is a massive uh, amount of progress. What is most interesting is that gender diversity, the difference, which was so large initially, that uh, a male had 44% of the male had bank accounts, but only 26% of the female had bank accounts. Today, both male and female all have 77% of them have bank accounts. So that is where uh, our progress is. Uh, the worry is that digital cyber frauds are on the rise. And if you see this data, it is mind-boggling. And that is why we decided that the theme today would focus more on the digital aspects. Uh, while we celebrate the IPFA Foundation Day, we have to be more uh, uh, forward-looking in terms of where the problems are arising and try to address them. Uh, so. Uh, while there are no very hard authentic statistics on cyber frauds and digital frauds, but the cyber in data is, uh, certain data is worrisome. So uh, I, I think uh, uh, there are uh, also crypto hacks going on, bank accounts hacks, and uh, those are the ones we should be addressing. Uh, government has taken a lot of initiative to buffer cyber, cyber security. The CERT in the National Computer Emergency Response Team is the ultimate backstop you have for any sort of hacking and stuff. Uh, while every regulator, everyone is working on this, uh, the CERT in at the end of it is virtually taking the responsibility that the cyber hacking is less. And uh, they have done a commendable job. Every, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, 
and the see uh, there were complaints about the hacking and uh, I, I'll tell you my personal experience. I mean, uh, you know why India is safe is because of the double authentication system, because we insist on OTP, and uh, most of the other world may not like that as it delays that extra 30 seconds you might have to spend is what is making your uh, digital transactions safe. Uh, I do remember I was in Paris when I sort of used my credit card and within uh, uh, seconds it had to be blocked because it became compromised without double authentication system. Their CVVs uh, can be read on the machine so there is no security. In India, the security is so high that the digital frauds have been very less, and that, that is uh, uh, still a worry because within that less number, the crimes are increasing. Uh, so uh, there are some organized crimes taking place where there are call centers which are actually hacking, uh, and with one piece of information shared on your bank account details, they just funnel that entire, if, if, if you have six bank accounts, the six of them can be simultaneously hacked and it will be funneled into multiple accounts of 100 plus accounts and it is very difficult to get to the trail and recover the money. So it's, it's a fight, we have to be conscious together. We all have to work together in order to address them and uh, this is what we need to do. Uh, and I do remember there was this interesting 2% and 12% uh, interest rate which was shown. So I was doing an outreach on financial uh, uh, sort of literacy, uh, maybe 300 kilometers of Calcutta in a remote village where some of the NGO was doing financial literacy program for the uh, rural women. And when I went there and I showed, they told me, okay, he's a former RBI executive director and now IPFA professor and that they were very excited. And they said, so I had my laptop, I took out my laptop and told them that, uh, uh, see, I have come here to give you a fixed deposit rate. If anybody wants to be saving, I'll give you 13%. You don't get that in bank. So please tell me who wants to open. And uh, um, they all were keen to listen, 13%, okay, we'll get, fine. Uh, and then I said, uh, you have to tell me your bank account details, your, what is your PIN, what is it? And it was very clear I did this with two sets of people, one who had gone through the financial literacy program, who refused to share, and the one which didn't had gone through the financial literacy program, which very, uh, excitedly shared their things. So this was an eye-opener for me, and that's where the importance of outreaches are uh, very, very crucial. So that is uh, uh, in some sense. So we have to worry about digital fraud protection. Uh, so I, for since time is already up, I will not go into detail. You have to work on mod mobile protection. So say whatever, uh, use of P VPN is important. Uh, maybe I'll circulate these slides and you can see it later. Uh, what is new in the area of investor protection, I think we need all need to focus more on, is the digital asset space, where there is myriad of uh, assets floating around, and uh, they have a mixed quality, some very good, some very bad. So, you know, technology is an advancement. It is empowering you. Uh, but how you use technology and regulate its applications are crucial. Uh, so your progress or regress will depend essentially on that basis. And digital space has many constructive assets uh, to make us less cash society, but yet the speculative elements are playing with it. And cryptocurrencies and so-called stable coin, which I think is a complete misnomer because no stable coin can be stable because if it is stable, no investor will invest on it. So they are investing essentially to make money out of its value uh, uh, chain. Uh, so they, they are, uh, there's no underlying, there's nothing. So uh, it's, it makes sense to control uh, these for, from the angle of uh, 
customer protection. It is very, very crucial. The faster the legislative bills come, the better it is. Uh, global regulation on these areas behind the curve. It, there's no consensus. We need global cooperation. But if you talk to the Nordic countries, they will all want no regulation of the crypto space, whereas India, China would want to ban it. I mean, how do you merge these conflicting views is a sort of a challenge. Another area we need to look at is the ESG investing. And ESG investing, as you all know, uh, essentially stands for environment, social, and governance factors. And this is the latest craze. The boom is taking place. but. Uh, um, uh, you know, most of the money now is coming into ESG sector because everyone is worried about climate change, uh, including the emerging markets and developing countries. But the key issue is how you do distinguish fluff from the fundamentals in the ESG investing. And I think uh, if we have to avoid boom and bust on this, then we need to work more on this issue. So let me sum up by saying that the road ahead on investor protection uh, I think uh, we need to focus on uh, the government policies, the regulatory policies. We in IPFA and the funded researchers also need to think, and uh, also the private sector, including NGOs. Uh, so how to deal with these new dimensions of investor protection that are fast emerging with changing times, technology, and practices. Uh, so protecting investors in digital world is extremely important. Focusing on emerging digital assets is important. The crypto space in particular, we need to keep watching on ESG investing. Uh, we need to think how to step up reg tech and sup tech, uh, the regulatory uh, technology and the sup, uh, supervisory technology, which could be digitally savvy in order to protect investors. Um, there are issues of intraday trading, leverage margin training, uh, trading, so uh, uh, we have to closely monitor them. Uh, not with closed eyes, but with closed eyes. <laughs> so that's where, thank you. So that's what I So I, I think we are almost at the end of the uh, forenoon session. I'll request Dr. Anil Kumar Sharma to come over for the vote of thanks. Thank you, good afternoon. I'll not really stand between you and lunch. I'll just thank a few people, and I think, you know, the morning session, the inaugural session, went off extremely well. I think the areas that they covered were actually from the ground level to the macro level. So I think, you know, that's what you saw in various presentations that were made in the morning session. And first, I would like to thank uh, Shrimati Anita Shah Akela, CEO of IPFA for delivering the keynote address um, and inaugurating you know, today's session. Um, and also the speakers of the inaugural session. So I'll start uh, with thank by thanking Mr. M.R. Shrikanth, Manager, Reserve Bank of India, who made an interesting presentation. Um, and you know, the entire team of IPFA, particularly Mr. Rakesh Jain, Mr. Sumit Agrawal, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Rane, and I think uh, Ms. Gaurav Gupta, Sumit Agrawal, uh, and also um, I think you know, the people at NCAER who have been instrumental in organizing this workshop. I'll not really take the names of the entire team, but I think you know, there, are a, there are a few people that I need to really recognize, particularly Mr. Piyush Gupta, Girish Khulbe, Sudesh Bala, uh, Anupama Mehta, Kushvinder Kaur, um, and I think you know the entire maintenance team. There is a, there are a lot of people who have really uh, been uh, been instrumental in organizing this. Rakesh, Rakesh, and uh, and team from IT, um, and also I would like to thank uh, participants from outside NCAR, 
And in particular, uh, I would like to recognize Dr. Rajiv Johari and Dr. Indreen Mandal from Institute uh, of Technology and Science, Ghaziabad, and their students who are really participating in this uh, session today. And also Dr. Rajendra Bandari uh, and uh, Dr. Susanta Biro from Christ University uh, and their students, you know, who are really participating. They are future investors, so it is important uh, for them to really know what's going on. And I think uh, I'm sure that they would have really benefited from today's sessions. Um, and I think, you know, the experience that they shared of their grandparents, parents, you know, how they have been through this process, I'm sure they have been uh, educated and uh, they will uh, really make wise investing as they become, as they start investing more and more, and they are future investors, as you all know. Um, of course, you know, there is a session in the afternoon. I will not really thank people. I think, you know, that yeah, is in the afternoon. Can take this but occasion I, <laughs> also to thank the IPFA team, yeah. uh, also Tushar, Sumit, and others, yeah, yeah, and yeah, Nazma, yeah. who was very closely working Of course, with of course. I wanted to take her name at the end because, you know, she has been a bridge between NCAER and IPFA, and not just on this occasion, but on all previous occasions where we have really organized several webinars, the series of webinars that we have really organized under the IPFA chair unit uh, throughout, the, throughout last year during the pandemic when we were not really organizing in-person seminars. But of course, you know, we have now started organizing in-person seminars, so going forward, Dr. Mridul Sagar, you know, will really uh, organize several of these sessions going forward. So thank you so much, Najma ji, and uh, the entire team of IPFA once again. Thank you very, very much in participating. <laughs>
Uh, thank you, Mrudul, and thank you also to NCAR for inviting me here. As uh, Mrudul has said, we really have an excellent panel, and the reason why I say that I particularly emphasize the word excellent, simply because we have representatives from all the key players. We have from SEBI, from RBI, as well as from IEPFA, which is actually essentially the three main players, the usual suspects maybe one can say in the case in the digital world. I emphasize SEBI, and the reason why I say collaboration is important is because this talks about investor protection. Now, I think in India, very often we get confused between investors and savers. The Reserve Bank of India and banks look after basically savers and borrowers. And it is SEBI which is responsible for investors. Very often in India, we make the mistake of thinking that an investor is the same as a saver. And I'm sure Mr. Garg will agree with me that when he says that SEBI's profile and you know mandate is very different. So we have Mr. Garg from SEBI to look after the investor interest. And we talk about the digital world. Essentially, in India, the digital world, when you talk about financial area, we're still basically talking about payments and now perhaps a little bit of lending, which is where the Reserve Bank of India comes in. And we have two people from the Reserve Bank of India. We have Mr. Dash as well as Mridal, who was, who was still very recently with the Reserve Bank of India and now has moved to NCAAR. And then, of course, we have the IEPFA, which has a tough job, really, of managing investor protection. It's a relatively new entrant into the field. So I think one needs to moderate one's expectations of what IEPFA can really achieve. And then, of course, we also have Mr. Malotra from the Cybercrime Unit of the Delhi Police. And I think this is an area which is even newer still, because for the police and for the government to really understand what cybercrime is all about, to do things in terms of enforcement, implementation, and most importantly, punishment, because deterrent is one aspect of it. The other aspect is when you catch somebody who's actually done something wrong, how do you meet out such an exemplary punishment, given the kind of judicial system we have in the country, where it would take donkeys here if ever for the wrong, you know, so the guilty to be brought to tasks. So I think with that kind of panel that we have here, I think, in fact, I wanted to just add that IEPFA, I think, has been, has been modeled on the basis of the US, you know, National Securities Administration Authority, NASA. We've all heard of NASA, though none of us perhaps will ever go to space, but none of us have heard of NASA, though all of us, I think, have done a digital transaction. And God forbid, at least a few of us in this room, we already, I have somebody here who's already been at the receiving end of a cyber crime. So I think with that, let me just turn over. Let me very quickly give you the modus operandi. The modus operandi would be for each of the panelists. I'm sorry, I have Rajesh Garg also. I Rakesh Garg, sorry, Rakesh Jain, right? From, from IPFA member again, who's just recently also joined us on the panel. My apologies for the, not introducing him earlier. So I think the modus operandi that I plan to adopt is that you know each of the panelists will make an opening statement as brief as possible, maybe five to 10 minutes. And based on what the takeaways are from theirs, I will perhaps set the ball rolling and throw some questions, after which I do plan to open the floor to all the participants over here. I'm glad to see a full house. So I think maybe we can start with uh, Mr. Garg from SEBI, because perhaps I think SEBI is perhaps, as I said, the most responsible uh, what shall I say, responsible for investor protection. They've done a fair bit, but digital area is something that is new to them also. And now we also have the added problem of crypto, which both SEBI and RBI are both trying to say, not my baby, not my baby. Whose baby is it really then in that case? So maybe I'll start with uh, Mr. Garg, and then perhaps we'll move on to RBI, and then of course we'll open it up huh, to rest. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, Methili ji. Uh, uh, for your kind words and uh, for uh, introduction. And uh, I convey my congratulations to IPFA. I'm part of it, so being the family, congratulate, congratulate on this, their foundation day. And uh, very honored to be part of this panel, some of the very learned people on the dais. And this very, very, uh, you know, good gathering, and I can see that uh, many of the students and the future leaders here. Uh, let me start with the saying that, uh, uh, you know, today we are discussing the investor protections and uh, as well as education part of it and what SEBI does it. Uh, so let me start that we have two uh, distinguished areas where we actually uh, interact with the investors and I always tell gently all my colleagues that yours is one department where we are actually directly interacting with the people of the nation. So this department actually for a general common investor is very, very important because people interact with us. 
just to give an example that uh, uh, it's good that we feel happy that uh, uh, we have a mail called sebi at sebi.gov.in. We get more than 125,000 mails every year. Huge amount of expectations from people which actually makes us happy and uh, you know how much people care for it. For example, we have Ask Sebi. You ask us if you have any issue. Uh, that is where we try our best to reply to your queries about the securities market and uh, uh, you know any issue you have. So let me start with our uh, how we handle actually investors' queries when it comes to the uh, grievance part of it and how the technology play very, very important uh, role in it. So probably we are among the first uh, regulators who came with the online uh, complaint judicial system score sometime in 2010. And uh, let me tell you that uh, we started with the uh, redressing online. Today, uh, you know, sometimes you feel that people are not so tech savvy. But I'm very happy to say today 90% of complaints we receive online. So it means the pen and paper complaints we get just 10%. And let me also tell you that over the period market intermediaries have also become so tech savvy that our first line of uh, uh, you know, resolving your complaint is it goes to directly to exchanges, brokers, intermediaries. So 50% complaints gets resolved even our, without our intervention. Because they know if they don't resolve within a period of 30 days, then it becomes, uh, uh, you know, it comes to us, then our individual officers are responsible. And that's how this online system and the digital, uh, digitization has become very, very important. So to begin with that. Uh, second thing is that uh, if we can, how do we help the citizens? So for complaint redressal, after that next day is come is our uh, toll-free helpline. If you are still feeling that there is an issue, uh, you are not able to you know, uh, put your complaints properly, or in language of your choice, you come to please our helpline, lodge your complaint, our staff will try our best to reply to you. So as I mentioned, SEBI mail, you can do, you can make online, you can go to the toll-free helpline. Next we also do is that, are we actually just complaint resolver or problem solver? So from the basis of the complaints, we do our root cause analysis of complaints every quarterly, minimum every quarter. And many of the policy decisions which are important for the investors, they come from the complaints. So instead of just resolving the complaint, we go to the root cause of the complaints. And this has always been our endeavor that once a quarter we do a thorough analysis and make changes in the regulations. Next, if you have recently noticed that uh, we have also started a policy of, you can call it naming and shaming. So if there is any complaint which is pending for most, more than three months, you know, you can't always resolve the complaint by regulatory action. So we always try that if possible, and if you feel that it is not such a thing, but still if a complaint is pending with us, where we feel immediately regulatory action is not warranted, but more than three months complaint are put on our website. Let world at large see that who are the people or who are the bad guys in the market who are not resolving your complaint. You take decide your decision whether you want to work with it. Fortunately, number is not very large. It is generally not in three digits. 20, 30 complaints are still there, which are more than 20, more than three months old, and then they immediately get resolved. The moment they see that our name is going to be published, SEBI is going to put, newspaper picks up, they immediately take uh, action on it. Still, if it is not there, then SEBI uses it uh, regulatory power for punishment also. But one more thing which I'll say that, uh, uh, you know, it is not just the uh, complaint resolving, but our equally big focus is on investor education also. Because people should know that where and how to invest, what are their rights, responsibility, do's and don'ts. And uh, recently we came with the concept of investor charter also. So if you see there is an investor charter for all market intermediaries. If anyone is investing in the securities market, please check. You will find that a broker, what is the broker's responsibility? What are your rights? What are you are supposed to do and don'ts? And in how many days they are supposed to provide you various services. So for all market intermediaries, there is an investor charter. Investors can go and see that how their issues will be handled. In addition to that, I am very happy to say that we have a number of uh, 
uh, education programs, whether one is like a uh, ma'am very nicely said that savers and investors. So, you know, savers doesn't, uh, so the first step according to me for anyone is starts with the banking transactions. So there is no point in taking someone to suddenly for mutual funds or for the share market. So we have a separate uh, program called resource persons programs. We have some 800 learned people across the country who do the basic financial literacy for the citizens. We have come out of that uh, thought that we will only take the investor education because investor education comes next. And that is the area where we tell people about the basic financial literacy. Let us appreciate whether we like it or not. We are yet to take financial literacy as part of our school or college curriculum. And whatever knowledge our parents had, we are just carrying that knowledge. We are very late in life to actually become saver to investors. So the intention is that uh, if it is till it becomes a formal part of curriculum, some way or other, which we are parallelly trying through, uh, you know, all the regulators, at least we try our best through uh, SEBI efforts, through National Center for Financial Education. So the uh, different programs for financial literacy are done. We also have investor associations. Unfortunately, not many uh, people come forward for the associations and then uh, you know conduct the programs. They are all, uh, SEBI will be more than happy. Recently, we came for the higher end program. We call it Smart Security Market Trainers Program where these trainers conduct the program of your choice, your place, for a target group, wherever you want, in any part of the country. And let me submit, all these programs are free. SEBI takes pride in doing this program. We have opened all our office to tell students, all these students sitting here, visit SEBI program. Whenever you feel, today I was coming to Delhi office, extremely happy to see at lunch 50 students coming and understanding the you know, some basics of securities markets. And there are other uh, large number of programs, including recently we came with a educational Sarthi app, which also tells you that what investors should do, uh, our different presentations on different topics, all that is available. We have a separate website, investor.sebi.gov.in. Kindly visit it. You see, you know, the problem is that uh, sometimes we are, uh, you know, so keen about a small message coming on our uh, uh, you know, some WhatsApp and we don't check it on a authentic sources. So I'll request you if you have, uh, you know, ever you want authentic knowledge, please visit SEBI, Reserve Bank of India, IPFA website, which will give you the right perspective. Because that's the most important. Knowledge is the key. When there, Don't be in hurry to invest or something came to you, some great idea, please don't go by that. First, you please verify the information or if there is doubt, there are enough respected source, please cross-check there. So I think uh, with that, I'll uh, conclude my uh, opening remark. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Garg. You, yes, SEBI has done a great deal. I think, unfortunately, there's so much more that remains to be done, primarily because I think in India, people are not really willing to turn to authentic sources. They're much more eager and keen to go by whatever tips they get, so-called tips. And today's, with social media being what it is, n number of people are willing to give tips. So let me now turn to Mr. Dash. And Mr. Dash, I'd like you to focus on the digital world, because I think the topic that we have for the panel is not so much investor protection, which I think for the first half was devoted to that, investor awareness and educational protection. But I want you to kind of focus, if possible, on the digital world, saying how is investor protection different in the digital world as compared to the non-digital world? And before I pass the mic on to you, my apologies to you, Colonel Anand. I'm so sorry. There are two of you from IEPF, and I think... Uh, Mr. Jen, you can blame him. He, you know, you were hidden behind him. So my apologies, my sincere apologies. And with that, Mr. Dash, it's over to you. Thank you, and thank you, IPF, for giving me this opportunity to be here. Uh, digital world is a very large world. I will not be able to talk about that. So I will limit myself to what is called DFS, Digital Financial Services, which will cover the areas like uh, Mr. Garg mentioned. And uh, before the meeting, I was just discussing with the guard because it's about investors, and Reserve Bank of India doesn't deal with investors. So that's why my first interaction with this. But in a broader note, as he mentioned, before anybody becomes a, an investor, everybody is a bank customer, and every investor is a bank customer. And talking about the digital world, the recent, I would call it, uh, platformization 
of all the DFS, that is digital financial services, really has blurred the distinction between an investor, a consumer, and everything. Today you may be an investor, tomorrow you are just a consumer, you are helpless. And secondly, the importance of consumer comes if you have been reading paper even a few days back. The entire story of Indian growth is best what they call it consumption driven growth. So that is so important and that is one of the main building block that on which strength India is growing. Investor is the first factor of production because I see a lot of students and they need protection. What about the consumer? They definitely they need the protection. And uh, if you have read the uh, Consumer Protection Act 2019, this has been given as a right, right to be protected. And protection is given only to those who are weak or they cannot protect themselves. And again, uh, taking one thread from the investors and digitalization, today from the gathering, the young people who are there, they may or may not be investor, but possibly they will not be associated with IEPFL future thanks to digitalization. Because all of the people whose money, dividend or anything, this is my guess, again, I don't have much information, but that must be from the physical days when they, all the scripts were in physical mode and check payment, etc. Nowadays, with the digitalization, with the dematerialization, I don't think any new investor would be facing those problems. That is the contribution of digitalization to investors. So essentially, digitalization is solving a lot of problems. But what from the people who have to be protected? Before I talk about, I'm giving you this concept so that you can understand the regulatory perspective, how the protection comes into picture. I'll talk about what RBI does. I'll talk about the digital uh, payment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and I'll not take much time. Uh, so there is a concept some of you might have heard. It's called. Uh, Fence paradox, fence paradox. Fence paradox, it comes, it's a kind of, it says, the more we try to make the world a better place, we get into worse problems. And uh, I recently saw a kind of uh, cartoon in one of the uh, place, which very easily explained the regulators and the consumers or who are the beneficiary of regulation. Fence is something which is created so that people are kept safe. So it's a cliff. People should not look down and fall back. So regulators, they put a fence on this so that people don't go there, don't look there. But now people feel very safe. Now that fence is there, everybody comes, lean on the fence to see what is there, and the fence breaks. And the damage is much less, much higher than what would have otherwise happened. So this picture comes to my mind when you are talking about the... Uh, about the consumer protection. As I will go on telling, you will find that so much has been done for the consumer protection, but still there is no resolution in view. The fate of the consumers is not really getting better or getting to a zero issue position. And this is one of the paradox. Now I will talk about uh, <coughs> RBA and consumer protection as like SEBI has been in the forefront and consumer protection. I think all the financial regulators, they're doing their bit to, to really help their constituencies or the clientele who are depending on them. Similarly, RBI also Dutch, but RBI in many places, whenever it happens, you may be doing some kind of financial service you must be availing, but everybody is availing the banking service. So that is the the kind of parent area where the consumer comes when in the financial services. Parent area where the uh, consumer protection uh, need to be there. And as far as RBI is concerned, when we are talking about consumer protection, there is one part which is visible to the consumer what is being done for that. But there is a very major part which is not like a, you know, what they call iceberg. There is a big part which is not visible to consumer and that is actually creating effect Otherwise, like I mentioned, I read in a few days back in the newspaper, uh, Wild West or something that's of print text that Tom was used in one of the newspaper. If it is free for all, possibly you don't know where it would be. And uh, let me uh, upfront tell that the, even if the numbers are growing uh, in a lot of uh, consumer uh, exploitation, the, the rate of growth has come down, the pace has come down. And then if you have to see effectiveness of the consumer protection, measures taken by different regulators, you have to really compare with 
what would have happened if this were not there? That is the way to look. You cannot look at such it's growing and all what is happening because the entire world and particularly the digital world is something is changing every day. And if one particular hole is plugged, there is 10 new holes are coming. And the limitation of another limitation of uh, in the digital regulation, I would say, this is a, I don't know, uh, I don't know whether Dakshmoro is the right word. Digital is global. Digital doesn't have a geography. Whereas regulation has a geography. And I will come to it because this was actually very well established, this particular fact. And people from law enforcement agency will agree with me during this uh, lending ops for which RBA came out with it, lending ops and all. The entire thing is coming from outside. And second part I would like to say, the risk in digital lending or for that matter, in innovative product which is coming to the market right now, it is managed by a set of unregulated but very powerful group of entities or persons or whatever. But the limitation of the regulators is to control or regulate it only through the regulated entities. So the transmission loss you can understand. Okay, I hope you are getting what I'm trying to say. So these are the limitations of regulation to do the consumer protection. But notwithstanding, this doesn't diminish the need to, uh, to, uh, to at the same time protect the consumers, which we have been doing. Anyway, to cut the long story start, I'll just uh, read out or rather tell you kind of the journey of RBI in digital part, uh, how they are uh, consumer centric, you can call it investor centric or depositor centric. In, uh, we know that you can't, uh, for example, I'll tell the second largest complaint which uh, RBI ombudsman receives, which is the complaint mechanism for RBI, is about service deficiency or conduct. If you go to a bank, somebody is misbehaving with you, can this be regulated? This cannot be regulated because this will be debatable and all. So for that matter, in 2006, RBI had set up something called BCSBI, which is a Banking Codes and Standards Board of India, which now that fair practice code was uh, uh, kind of introduced by them. Subsequently, 21, this has been wound down because now we are slowly taking over through regulation, right? And uh, mobile banking is one of the major source, major kind of channel for banking today is the highest number one. And RBI had come out with how the mobile banking should happen. It was issued to the banks in 2014. That is from where the digital consumer protection thing came. And this is all that, 2014. And secondly, then they were charging very high fees. Like you remember in 2017, December 2017, those fees were regulated. Otherwise, consumer, if you know that they, now it will, so there is a debate whether UPI should be chargeable, not chargeable. But since 2017, RBA has controlled it. So you know that if you're able to do a free uh, UPI, it's because of that. And there are certain underdeveloped regions in say, Northeast and all, where RBA has created fonts like IPF so that uh, the entire digital mode is free for all the, even the vendors. Then uh, in 2019, uh, that uh, you know, recurring payment, e-payment, how it is safeguarded, that those kind of guidelines were issued so that people are protected. And 29, uh, 29 sorry, uh, that is another thing, most important thing I'll say. Uh, it's about the mistakes we make, all of us we make, and we lose money in the digital transaction. And if you know a pure digital world, as it is mentioned, you will not find a single human being to talk to many times. And you do, may not have an address, I'm not talking about banks or uh, in uh, companies, but like all, say, any uh, online platforms and all. So that is the challenge of digital world. And in case of banks, this was a very, uh, you know, you know, ground groundbreaking uh, uh, intervention of the regulator. I hope you all know. In 2017, we came out with guidelines that if there is a loss to the customer, consumer, or you say investor, uh, because of the, in the cyber world, that is a digital transaction, you will not bear any loss. It was kind of insured. I know. I don't know whether the previous sessions it has been talked about. Then I will not repeat. Uh, but then uh, this was insured. Kind of insured. The banks have to do it. And if you report within three days, what is your thing? So all those kind of things. So the, if the consumer is not doing anything wrong, and I will try to narrow it down to if you have not shared your OTP kind of things, you have not been, uh, you know, mistaken. You will not lose any money. That is the regulation, and banks have to abide by this. I think this is a very big contribution of RBI to do that. And subsequently, also, 
uh, in the in the world of NEFT, RTGS, uh, uh, IMPS, um, ATM transactions for that matter, those turnaround time has been there. If it's a failed transaction, they have to you know return within T plus one the next day. Otherwise, they pay 100 rupees per day. You go for credit card now. Credit card, if you want to stop it, if it doesn't stop, uh, they don't stop it like within uh, stop means I close the account. Stop has to be instant. So they pay 500 rupees per day. So those are things which have been imposed on the banks and consumers should be aware to use that. I'll come to the other kind of uh, things which you have done for the bank side. Uh, we have done online dispute uh, resolution, so everything is digital on that. Uh, then card tokenization you'd be hearing uh, nowadays. Uh, we have issued digital payment uh, security controls. Uh, then another which is directly to the consumers, we have enabled uh, maybe in 2017 or so, uh, that on, you, you are managing your own cards, that you can disable, enable, or put a limit on your card. So, and many people may not be using it and they lose money. This is one part of it. The second part is all of us, and uh, in one uh, independent survey I read recently, 42% of the people has been uh, facing uh, some kind of fraud, digital fraud, or, or during the last three years. And uh, of all the people who pay, only 17% get back their money. So this is some independent statistics, not from the RBA. Uh, so the precaution which the people should take, they should be aware, and they don't report. They don't report because we know there are issues in reporting to banks and all. But then if you report in real time, you make the complaint, uh, you can be absolved of your liability. That is some kind of incentive for the people to report. And to facilitate further, the government of India, I think they have a uh, national cyber, uh, cyber reporting portal is there. You can report that and it's very effective. And we also receive all the data regarding what kind of uh, uh, frauds are happening. We take care, but that's not in the public domain. Uh, another challenge I would say uh, people should be cautious about is normally whenever we are doing a transaction, we think of the physical world. Uh, I think old timers said there, be, there used to be something called uh, Negotiable Instrument Act. There are rules how to, as a banker, you would recall, uh, good faith and all. So many things you have to take before passing a check. But nowadays, if you are trying to make a payment, the single identifier is your bank account number. You may put uh, three more, more uh, kind of information, but that is not material. So that distinction you have to kind of keep in mind. And uh, see the challenge again, I'm saying the trade-off. Suppose you want to do the second factor check also. You can't have an immediate payment. For example, UPI is the highest uh, fraud occurring area now, UPIs. Card has come down because of the various steps we have taken. UPI, there is a suggestion that whether we can give it, say, 30 minutes uh, cooling time. Because UPI, when a fraud happens, somebody takes from your account. Instant credit is possible. So we try to debate among us with 30 minutes, so nothing can happen, so that it can be cut. But then people are not agreeable. They're used to that, no, instantly it should be. So that is the trade-off I'm trying to say. Uh, so that's about it. And digital lending, I don't think uh, if anybody has read about it, I can address that. But that's a slightly different subject. But if you see the kind of uh, steps we have taken, I can say opening steps we have taken in digital lending, it is addressing some of the problems at the root rather than at the uh, kind of symptom level or at complaint level. Uh, if there is anything specific, I'll talk, but for the interest of time, I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dash. You raised a lot of very interesting points. I think I'll just turn over to the IEPFA members. Uh, Mr. Jain, would you like to go first, or Colonel Anand would like to go first? We'll just try and stick to that five to ten minutes. And the Thank two of you, maybe five minutes each, since there's both of you speaking from Ms. the same Ali, organization. Uh, nice. Uh, first of all, I must uh, appreciate the topic which has been taken is investor protection in a digital world. Now, what do we mean by this? I would split this into two parts. One is investor protection and second is in digital world. Now, if we look at it, investor protection remains same, whether it is in digital world or it is in normal physical world. Where we have talked a lot in the earlier sessions also and we have been, every agency has been talking about and there are many, many agencies which are working, besides SEBI, RBI, mutual funds, MFI, the various intermediaries, banks. Everybody is talking about investor awareness, and we feel that investor awareness is going to go in a big way. IEPF, in a big way, is also talking about investor awareness 
investor literacy and talking about the risk reward relationship, physical discipline in investing and things like that. Let me come to digital world. What do we mean by digital world? Digital world means basically, like I'll start this saying this, Honorable Prime Minister keeps on talking about we want digital India. Now what do we mean by digital India? This means that every information about the country should be in digital form. Digital forms means computers or in electronic form. It's the same way the digital world means that all information is in digital form. It has its own advantages as well as disadvantages. Like we always say, speed thrills, but speed kills also. It's the same way that digital world makes the things very, very easy and fast, but then it has its own consequences. We must understand that because there is a speed and there is a moment, there is a volume which can come in digital world and there could be risks, does it mean that we don't go for that? Yes, we need to go for that. Uh, I won't take long, but I would like to just uh, talk about an old story which I'm sure everybody would have read, is the hare and tortoise. That story has changed. Earlier it was slow and steady who used to win the race, but if you go to Google, now there are four stages which has come. And one of the important pass, part is that fast and steady wins the race. That means a stage has come where you have to be fast. That means you have to go to digital world. Now, in digital world, how we bring investor protection? When digital world has gone, it has brought along with very important thing that is business intelligence, artificial intelligence, and information which could be drawn from the digital world in no, uh, no time because computers and all can help you in drawing those information. We have to see that how much we are using these digital informations and how much analysis and how much business intelligence are we building in our various digital data to ensure that that uh, protection is built. When I'm talking about investor protection, I would also like to touch upon two parts. Investor protection is of two kind. One is investor awareness, knowledge, and ensuring that that Investor do not make the mistake. The second part along with investor protection comes is that in case he makes a mistake, how fast and how his losses could be redeemed or could be compensated or could be recovered. Now these two parts are very important for investor education and uh, protection. So coming back on digital world, my view is that in case we are able to draw out digital world in a manner where we can cr create business intelligence and create mechanism, like I'll give the reference of what Mr. Gurk talked about is that whatever complaint they get digitally, they establish the root cause virtually say every quarter. And then, now in case these root causes could be established through digital world itself and through business intelligence, it will become much more easier to identify where the problems are and people could be identified. Like Mr. Dash talked about uh, customer service. So even through digital thing, we can even verify that which branch, which particular person is creating misbehaving. And hence, one can see that one chance can be given, two chance can be given, and third chance need not be given. You know, so all this is possible through the digital world, and hence we can bring investor protection by analyzing the digital data and creating business intelligence on the digital data. And with this, I will thank, and I'll give, give it to... Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Jain. Colonel Lani. Good afternoon, everyone. After a, I think, good meal. I know it's a heavy session, but it's very informative for the youngsters, for the college students with us. You have to understand that, you have to understand the nitty gritties of the subject matter. So when we talk about IPFA, it's a very young organization, though it's a six years old. However, practically, we are three, year, three financial years is the main uh, years we have been worked upon. And before I get into the protection aspects, I just wanted to highlight a few things that in this short duration of time, we have got two mandate. One is to return the shares to the, the people. Uh, we are basically like a bank. We are custodian of your shares and dividend. And once uh, you s uh, prove it that it is yours or it is your parents and you have got a succession transmission, we return it to you. Now, uh, in this short span of three years or plus, uh, we have been able to return approximately around two crore numbers of shares back to the, the countrymen. And the, so it's a big number. We have been able to somewhat 
uh, returned around 30 crore worth of dividend because earlier the dividend used to be 50 rupees also, 5 rupees also, it could be 1000 rupees also. So we are young organization, we are evolving, we are stabilizing. However, why this mandate of financial literacy to us? So we have a financial literacy mandate as per the legislative mandate. All the regulators or like SEBI, RBI, banks, uh, IPFA, everybody is uh, working towards financial literacy. Now why so? Now as per a survey in 2019, 27% of India is financially literate. 77% is the overall literacy, but we have a gap of 73%. Now this 73% gap has to be bridged and no one organization can do it. So every regulator, every organization have to come together wherein we can, because the spectrum is very wide. If you see right from the village level, more than 80 crore people are living in the villages. In a village also we got a men folk, woman folk and a youngster. The youngster has got a lot of uh, leap of faith, risk-taking capacity. The woman folk or the men folk will be more conservative in nature because of their uh, constraints. However, if you go to the northeastern region, the, the economy is driven by the women folk. If you come to central India, it has been driven by the men folk. So it's a mixed bag wherein no one fixed template, so you cannot brush the canvas with the same brush. You have to use multiple brushes, multiple templates to reach out to the masses. We at IPFA, so what we do is that we have to take care of the youngsters because more than uh, 60% of people are less than 35 years of age. So if with this basic statistics, if you see, and in years to come, we'll become a younger India. Now that means the youth has to take the lead. Now, if the youth has to take the lead, the first thing is to educate. So when we say investor education, if you are educated, then you will become aware of various things. When we are aware, you will start applying protection to the awareness aspect also. So technically, each one of you, the youth sitting over here, the student sitting here, you ask yourself how many of you have opened a bank account of any of your family members? If yes, it's a very good thing. If no, please try and open a bank account of any of your known, near and dear ones so that you take that pride of that, why that I've opened a bank account for my sister, my brother, my parents, my uncle, my aunt. Now what does that do? That does one thing is, once you are having a bank account, you will be able to connect them to the social security scheme of government of India. It could be a maid also, a housekeeper also. So once they are eligible to the social security scheme, first thing is they require a bank. Now, once you have a bank account with you, the other protection elements also come to it. So at IPFA, what we mandate is that we do segment approach. We want that youngsters to take the lead for that, what we have done is, we have reached out to Ministry of Education and from there it has come to UGC and the UGC has written to all VCs that please come with IPFA. The aim is that we want to make the youth or the, the students because in maybe one year or two years, they will get into the job market. The moment you get into the job market, from the first pay, if you can start planning your, your uh, if I t tell you, your, your retirement or your pension aspects, I'm sure by the time you retire, you will be well off and you do not have to think much about it. Because nobody at our age uh, groomed us in this way. So it our responsibility if, if we are able to make the youth educate them, aware them, and then they become the instrument. They become the vehicle of protection. Protection of the people who do not understand the dynamics of financial literacy, financial inclusion. So we intend at IPFA that the youngsters should take the lead. For that, what we have done is, this, this is a concept uh, paper which we have floated. So we are going to DU with Delhi University, first university, we are going to have a MOU, wherein inter-college competitions, the first thing will be, baseline will make the, the students aware with the same template of information, knowledge sharing. So Institute of Chartered Account of India will be our knowledge partner. So we will start off with basic level. Once they are aware of basic level information, then they will be doing some field work and they will get some credit points to their field work. So suppose we have got 1,000 students, and if 1,000 students are able to touch 1,000 villages, or able to convey the message of importance of money, banking, saving, which is a layman's language, if anybody is able to understand that, then in that case, automatically, we are empowering the resource person by making the youth as a resource person at the base level. They might not be, be technically qualified. They might not be a 
uh, a finance wizard, but yes, understanding of importance of money, budgeting, at that level, base level, I'm sure a youngster will understand. Plus the digital right now, because COVID has in fact forced us in a way, in a good way, and <clears throat> you'll be surprised the vegetable seller also says Paytm kar dije, UPI kar dije, you know, in a day-to-day -day functioning. Now, once they are also aware about it, now by being aware, because somebody is selling the product, they have got hold of the product, they're using the product. But what are the nitty gritties of the product? What are the protection element? Those they are not aware of. So to make them aware, I'm sure that once we have multiple resource persons at different level, at different strata of society, the message will automatically through them pass on to these people that how to go about it. Like very recently, we went in for a campaign of nomination that we wanted everybody should nominate. Whatever you do, we please have a nomination. Because our subject matter is financial literacy is, is very wide. We have to touch upon various topics. Now, for frauds, we have got at our uh, email, uh, at our website, we have got a button wherein you can talk about Ponzi schemes, chit funds, or any other schemes which are prevalent in your AOR, in the area, area or in your region. So that once we get those information, we are able to pass on to the ministries about various inputs which are relevant or where some Ponzi scheme is being run. So collectively, as a nation, if we all come together, I'm sure we will be able to do a good job. And so we have, as in the first half of the day, we had discussed about various partners with us. We are open to all partners coming with us because single-handedly we will not be able to do it. Collectively, we all will be able to do it. That's why we have got honorable members with us, Rakesh Jayanji and GP Gurg sir is there. So we all are working towards it so that we bring it to a logical conclusion. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Colonel Anand. And I'm sorry I cut you short, but I think because, you know, it's good that you're telling us about IEPF, but I think we try to stick to digital, you know, what is investor protection in the digital world. So I'm counting on you, Mrudul, to bring us back to the topic that we're trying to discuss, simply because I think in the morning session we have spent enough time talking about IEPF. So I think now we want to focus on, particularly because we have so many youngsters that who are much more familiar with the digital world than all of us sitting here, that what is the kind of investor protection that particularly targeted to the digital world? And one small request to the audience, please put your mobiles on silent. If you have a call, we just cannot wait. It's a matter of life and death. You have to attend to it. Please go out and attend. I'm sorry, but this is something that is important, and I think it's more important for you all than for us. So if you're not interested, please step out. Or if you have to take a call, please step out. But please put your mobiles on silent. Sorry, sounds dictatorial, but that is the way it is. Over to you, Mrudan. So uh, let me very quickly bring back uh, the focus of discussion on the topic. And uh, I'll raise just two things and maybe request Mr. KPS Malhotra yeah. to discuss his... Mr. Malhotra for the last, thing. because I think the cop show is always the yeah. last to yeah, grab yeah. <laughs> the guys who are guilty and catch them and say, what are you so, doing? So we'll ask him, what so, has he so, been doing? So I said, let yeah. everybody have their say, and then we'll put him on the spot. So yes. one thing, uh, purely, uh, I think uh, Mr. Dash, uh, Jayant Kumar Dash, uh, evaded uh, a lot of uh, discussion on the digital lending guidelines which uh, Reserve Bank is now bringing out. Uh, following his report, which he chaired the working group. Uh, I think there were two critical issues in that. Uh, one, uh, the legislative changes that you have demanded. So what prompted uh, you, uh, uh, the legislative framework, I agree, is pretty weak. So how do you view that legislation is one question I would have. The second question is uh, basically, uh, you have also said about the consent of individuals on the data. And I think this is a big issue which India's stack model has for times and again uh, sort of been emphasizing on that uh, the uh, digital democracy in India prevails. It's the individual which decides what is to be done about the data. I don't see any individual or common man knowing about uh, consent. I, 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 when, when you see things on the ground, some fine prints about what uh, the digital consent is given where data is going. Data is gold today. Data is uh, as uh, bigger than oil in that manner. It's going to decide who will rule uh, the economy, the global economy in times to come. And uh, therefore, this issue is pretty important because uh, uh, on the fine print, everybody signs. I mean, uh, if, if, 
you are asked everything on the internet whether you are giving consent you just tend to say yes and because you are in, uh, not even having time to scroll through the internet you need answers and you will agree to any consent which is asked upon then how do we ensure that uh, data uh, democracy is my question because uh, practically uh, nobody is able to do that the reserve bank has actually now allowed mirroring of the data are we sure the data is not going out of the geographies is the mirroring uh, good enough uh, to ensure that uh, basically data protections uh, on uh, on the geographies exist or is it something we have to compromise on the uh, to be part of the global uh, give and take on number of issues on the uh, issues uh, on global uh, front i think we are heading for the g20 presidency and it is one of the biggest uh, issue and a low hanging fruit we should seize this opportunity to raise this issue from the india side because we can then mold the work uh, uh, what as 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 a chair we can really mold the direction of work because this issue we can't avoid our presidency goes the next presidency will anyway have to deal the indonesian presidency is dealing with it uh, it started with the okasa declaration and we are missing the bus here uh, I, i think the biggest thing is we are having uh, on the uh, digital economy the e-commerce platforms uh, they are sort of uh, acquiring monopoly power uh, with couple of agencies virtually controlling not just the trade but the data information and data information is sort of giving them quite a lead uh, whereas we are sort of uh, way behind on uh, controlling this data we don't have proper legislations uh, so uh, i think uh, free data flow is what the indonesians uh, have talked on their uh, g20 presidency uh, we are not pretty comfortable we are not comfortable with the devos declaration on this so uh, can can we think about it how to seize this initiative i leave this to the panelists and then pass on so you're essentially talking rudul about data localization is it how important we should how much yeah because we data localization is important to investor protection to my mind okay. so uh, so that I, is what you uh, yes, the g20 yes. okay so now over to you mr malhotra i just wanted to ask you also focus on why is it that at least as far as public perception is concerned that the cyber crime that we just not able to catch nab the crooks and we just not able to kind of do enough to educate people about the modus operandi in order to prevent you know further such instances mr malhotra all yours yeah thank you so first of all i'll just like to touch on the basic question is that what is cyber crime in the today's world we cannot differentiate between any sort of a crime where cyber is not the means so if we say cyber as means be it terror narco everything is covered in the cyber crime arena and vis a vis we are talking about the financial okay. side so i'll stick to the financial side number one number two uh, that how and why the the graph of the cyber crime has grown over the time it has escalated to a limit that everybody feels it once or at once in their life they might have been just been a victim or were the victim of the cyber crime the reason is that though our gadgets and everything are becoming very smart we we hold smartphones in our hand that to use these smartphones somewhere or the other we lack that knowledge what to do what not to do i'll come to a very basic point like there are instant loan applications which which have created a lot of news of late and even we busted two three networks and the scam was around 2200 crores so that means that what is happening is the point which which has been uh, highlighted about the data now when you download such an application which is malicious in nature you are getting that app or that person having access has the access to all the data of your phone not only your phone book your gallery your mic your camera whatsoever so that is how they they start extorting so now now i'm sh- uh, just showing the very bleak side of the cyber crime where starting from just the investor you might there are loans which we have seen that uh, loan of 5000 6000 taken by students ending up in suicide why the reason is extortion the reason is blackmailing so now as as a user of such uh, smart devices user of such digital world we have to be very very well aware of the fact that any misuse or any uh, letting your data go to somebody who can misuse it can be a big problem in life so i'll 
that is one point about the data then is that how uh, the the investors they uh, they need police as the responder now we come into picture when somebody is duped we come into picture when we are trying to spread awareness now he all uh, sir has already highlighted about the point that there is a uh, financial fraud helpline that is by 1930 so in case somebody is duped there is a golden hour one has to stick to that point that immediately inform on 1930 the system is evolving over time we we initiated this at the delhi police level now it's a pan india level project but now the main problem many of you will complain that we called but the call was not logged in the reason is that the, the magnitude of cyber crime the way it's increasing the resources have to be commensurate on that fact as well we have taken that in, into our consideration and now we are upgrading these uh, capabilities so that the uh, the the grievance is immediately redressed and uh, during the golden hour the money can be blocked in the financial system the digitalization of this financial system has created an opportunity that with the click of uh, uh, the mouse one can see where the money is flowing and when the uh, upi and uh, npci comes on board with us we'll be in a position to protect that money flow and block that money within the financial system so it does not move out as a cash and so that we are able to protect the investors interest now the baby which was not owned crypto so so that that particular uh, uh, modus operandi is becoming prevalent as far as the users are concerned the law is not very clear on it but we know that where our role comes into being the first is in case some fraud takes place number 2 in case somebody is duped on the mlm scheme so if what is happening in the real world is happening in the digital world the types of crime they are just having the ramification on the digital world there all sets of crime happening and now crypto gives another layer of anonymity to such criminals so that's why it becomes the preferred mode of uh, payment as far as the criminals are concerned as far as the fraudsters are concerned now going back to the main point that why the police agencies they uh, it might appear that there are a lot of crime and the reaction is slow now while we talk our team has created uh, has uh, busted a, uh, a module in which we raided 27 places in india working backward on a simple modus operandi that is a bscs scam arrested 62 people that, that will be uh, opening up in a day or two arresting 63 people who were spread over the boundaryless concept of the digital world now it is not as simple as the person is robbing the money going on a motorcycle now they who's robbing you is sitting across many states and the instant loan application the data is not being hosted in india it is all going to china and if the data becomes the main part somewhere or the other how it is going to be used how it's going to be misused that becomes the main point of our concern so i'll stop here and i'll be open to the questions whatsoever the Uh, thank you so much. I was just there's a question that occurred to me, you know, while you were speaking, is that yes, since you have so many of these apps, so you know, you don't know the ownership, you don't know what kind of data is coming. Is it possible for any government agency, any other agency regulator, to regulate the apps that are available on Play Store? Because after all, these are apps that you download from Play Store. So if you have some kind of a licensing or registration of the apps that are possible that you can possibly have in Play Store, will that be a first line of defence? It can be, but now they have circumvented that concept of hosting the app on a Play Store. So okay. it becomes a peer-to-peer -peer share. Uh huh. So they are not even going on Play Store. They know that. we what we do we regularly analyze the source code of the malicious applications we update the google play store we update uh, app, apple ios that this is a uh, malicious in nature you drop this down and this source code belongs to these uh, uh, set of applications so drop these down as well but they don't uh, they they have their own system they go to peer to uh, from peer to peer sharing that a message from one person to another whatsapp message from one person to another so that is where one has to be aware that the application which is not even listed on the play store why a person is downloading so first step becomes a step of you now where the cyber criminal hits is either a need or a greed mm -hmm. need is that you need to immediately give your otp you need to immediately update your kyc otherwise your this particular facility will be blocked be it your uh, sebi account be it a banking account and in the need system they they dupe a person and greed we immediately are going to give you this much so make give the details we'll we'll give you this much so need and greed are the two points where the cyber fraudster hits the brain and 
whosoever is duped then the person says that i i don't know how i fell prey to it it was uh, it went so automatic so one has to be very care about the careful about two points whenever somebody raises the need or gives you some greed one has to be cautious that nothing comes up and also if you could just enlighten everybody sitting over here i believe there are cases where people have not shared their otp they have not given their phone to anybody else and still the you know bank account has been skimmed yeah, that's what how is it possible now in case you you have not shared the otp but your phone has a app which can forward the message so do you nobody needs the otp so there could be some apps where yeah, you don't are, need there are there are applications which so So is it possible for the police to circulate the names of these apps which we, have we uh, we we did circulate the list of around 108 applications last 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 week now the point is that uh, somewhere or the other we use the medium of our system which is uh, say our our twitter handles or or uh, you can uh, or the press but now the point is the connect between the public and the police is only when they fall into trouble Mm-hmm. nobody is interested to meet us before they fall into trouble <laughs> so the the khaki the black and the white these three dresses person no, i think perhaps what can be done is in the case of like investor awareness etc yeah. on television radio you have you know you yeah, have all india radio doing. you have the, doordarshan yes. so you will reach out to some kind of that. campaigns we are doing that which now rbi has now started doing a big yeah. way sebi also does you know so i think maybe the police also could do those kind of programs those those definitely points uh, are well taken and uh, on on the basis of the resources we have we do that now we are having a show with the radio city now what started with the concept of white listing now now suppose you don't know who is the fraudster who is not you open the google and search for a sbi uh, uh, customer care number and there are fraudster who have hosted their numbers so we started with this concept that we need to white list the banking numbers once there is white listing there immediately a system should check that this is a white listed number this is a black listed number this is a dubious number once we come to know about the dubious number we should immediately get it blocked that is where the step is prevention now what started with the idea from our delhi police our unit it all and the way it moved very quickly rbi itself came up with this idea that they are going to give us the list of all the white listing numbers so that is where things move fast so just uh, i'll say uh, this was 2nd of august this idea was floated and today we are on on 7th of september okay. and uh, R- rba is already on on that particular project mh is on that project so we and dot is on project that dot once we share that number with the dot dot will immediately block it so that is a good investor pr- investor protection that that number is blocked so that uh, fraudster will not be in a position to contact anybody You so want his, to say uh, something, Rizal? That's very in, uh, encouraging. What he told us uh, uh. is really a step forward. But I'm aware of some cases like uh, where sort of there are call centers uh, working in Gurgaon or other regions where, like, uh, uh, sort of a depositor make one mistake of sharing some bank information and uh, finds that based on them the call centers run certain algorithms. which uh, then hacks simultaneously all the accounts of a depositor and siphons off channeling them into multiple accounts more than 100 it will absolutely just get channeled on, absolutely agree on an me. algorithm basis so is it falling through the cracks between regulatory arbitrages and police uh, enforcements and stuff so how do we coordinate to solve this problem look the digital world is based on the concept of quickness it is ease of for us and a ease for fraudster as well as sir also pointed out that in case we we create a 30 minute window investors or the user will say it is it is not very promising but that's where they are also hitting on this point that they also know that it is a with a click of the mouse the money moves no doubt about it uh, we we have shared few red flags that in case there the money moves from one account to another to another to another in this fashion there should be immediate some sort of a uh, mechanism to stop it and we are working with the financial system we are working with npca as well so our unit works on the concept of economic security and not only for india because that's a boundaryless concept uh, not only for delhi for overall for the india india's perspective so we raise red flags these these are ideas which culminate into policies and and into regulations over a period of time the way the digital world is moving at a quick pace the policies have to move at the same pace otherwise it is always a catching up story now uh, 
peer to peer sharing of these messages we had a uh, discussion with whatsapp that you kindly analyze the hash value of these applications share the details who is the first originator so technically whatever is possible we are doing awareness component see the youngsters they can be the vehicle for the change the media can be the vehicle for change the educational institutes can be vehicle for change and whenever we i uh, i or our unit behaves on the principle that in case you arrest few media gives you more mileage because that's a sort of that everybody reads nobody is interested in awareness so when the person understands that these are, these people are caught now i i had antf also so we have arrested even i am uh, drop out in drug supply but we are not giving the names we want the youth to, youth should come back mm. to the mainstream but youngsters should also feel that the path this path downhill can be like a there is no coming back so no doubt about it uh, what what you have said is point well taken and uh, they are part of uh, our policy wherever we can give uh, input to the policy and uh, i4c works on that front and uh, even uh, regular meetings take place with npc rba on this account Mr. Dash, I had a question for you. You know, you talked about how customers, you know, when you talked about tokenization and two-factor authentication, why is there so much resistance from customers for something that is for their own benefit? Is it because of lack of education? Is there something that is missing over there? What is it that prevents them? Because even in the case of tokenization, like RBI has repeatedly extended its deadlines. So when the RBI itself repeatedly extends its deadlines, does it send the message that we ourselves are not very sure, or we ourselves are not very, you know, particular about it? Why do people resist? It's like you tell people to wear helmets, and you'll see any number of two-wheelers not wearing a helmet. Even the sad, uh, sad demise of Cyrus Mistry, you have an educated woman, a gynecologist, trying to overtake on the wrong side. What do you do with people? I mean, if, you, you, if somebody is refuses to kind of do, understand what is in their own benefit, what do you do? Do you insist and force it down, or do you just say, okay, caveat emptor, loser takes it all? Uh, when you are saying there's a lot of protest and all this thing, you have to remember one proverb, is the quickest wheel that gets the maximum grease. So the people who make noise in the, uh, you know, wherever you read or hear, they are a particular sect of people. They have different types of interest. It's not a common thing. And coming to the example you give, like seat belt and all this thing, yeah. I was wondering when I come, I was not wearing seat belt, though I was sitting in the backside, though I all the time, but I remember this thing, but yes. still I didn't wear. It's a human tendency, so to be very frank. And as far as the previous question which you dealt with, what is the, you know, the name of the app and all this thing. App, the name of the app is something like your email ID. You can change the app name, the app remains same. And there are millions, they are just proliferating. Mm -hmm. You can't hand, handle them like that. Okay. So I'll give an example how to stop the people from downloading, uh, you know, those remote access programs like say, AnyDesk. Now I think uh, there's a couple of banks we have verified is 100% working. If somebody has taken over your mobile at a remote location through some social engineering and uh, he's trying to access, the bank is able to catch and it will not allow the transaction to pass. So this is to just to stop the foolish people stupid people, stupid consumers to do it. No, if you read to the, uh, the advertisements of all the, uh, uh, you know, uh, regulators, everybody is saying don't download on verified apps. It's a simple thing. Why do you download it? Mm. So these are people are not, but then we are not stopping there. To help those kind of people, we are building something behind it, and it has a cost. As Mr. Jain will say, this will add to the uh, compliance cost. The banks are suffering because some people won't, won't be disciplined to help them. There is a huge cost, huge technology cost. And digitalization, again, I will come to another, jump into another aspect. Every, everybody says digitalization reduce this cost. You try to see that it is for these reasons that digitalization cost is never you know, enjoyed by the uh, consumers. It's because of such reasons, the sub erroneous people. So would you say that maybe given all this, there is a case for going a little slow on digitization? I know this is against the government stated policy, but given the risks and given the kind that we have a population where financial literacy is so low and the digital world awareness is even lower, even though all of them might possess a smartphone, is there a case for just going a little slow? 
This is completely off the record. <laughs> I'm not asking. I don't want to put you on a spot, but is there a case? I'm just wondering. No, I don't think. You okay. see, basically, you know, uh, particularly when it comes to regulation, uh, digitization, innovation, that must go on because we want to grow fast. The economy has to go, grow fast. Okay. So possibly that is something given. But only how the law enforcement how will catch, catch up, up or regulators okay. catch up. I can't talk about the law enforcement, but as far as the regulators are concerned, I think uh, Mr. Murdul will remember there was one, our former uh, governor, Dr. Reddy, his favorite word is uh, festina lente. So we do hurry and slowly. That's true. So that's how we manage it. <laughs> I find that we are already at 335, 40, so I'm sure all of you have some very interesting experiences given your age profile. So in case you would like to shoot any questions, we've got an excellent panel. As I said, please, so please use this opportunity. Is there anybody who would like to pose any questions, have any, have any queries, anybody at all? Vitaliji, uh, I have a yeah, question. Sure, please, Mr. Uh, Mr. Malota. Uh, you see, most of the cases, when the fraudulent money goes, it finally goes to some account. Can't we figure out the accounts where these money goes? Because there would be limited accounts only where this money, and because fraud finally happens through the, in collusion with the bank managers or with the concerned people. So can't we identify clearly where the money is going and how the money is, trail is going? And with that trail, we can really block those accounts. Because there may be 100, 200, thousands or such accounts. Rakesh, as I was telling you, like these get siphoned off into hundreds of accounts through algos. So then tracing becomes very but finally, difficult. you see, even if you are able to get 50 such accounts, people who are part to that, there are people behind accounts and the KYC is very strong. So now that means we are no. failing on KYC. Uh, if you are failing on KYC, then that means somebody uh, should be responsible for point, so The point is that uh, no doubt pre-activated cards, they are available, pre-activated accounts are available. The accounts are available on rent as well. Now, even uh, as far as the mobile phone is concerned, everybody says there are now very strict norms. The gang which we have busted, we are trying to get uh, the, uh, the SIM card in the name of somebody, but it's the photograph of Sunil Mittal, the owner of Airtel. So in case, while we talk, I get that SIM card. So that speaks volume of what KYC norms we might be projecting, but yes, there are loopholes. We, we busted this gang, they are in a position to bypass the live photo streaming of KYCs. So now we, in our office sitting, we are, as a project, we, as an academic and trust, we have given them the photograph of Sunil Mittal, the owner of Airtel, if I'm not, uh, if I'm not uh, incorrect. And his, if his photograph comes on that Airtel SIM card with somebody else's name, so that clearly shows that my limited point was the final money is going to some accounts. The, the point Those is that accounts that, like uh, you mentioned about pre-rented uh, cards. Accounts. We definitely block the accounts, but the point is every day these accounts are coming like they are mushrooming. We, the, the KYC norms and the way the accounts are being given, somewhere or the other, that, if that is taken care of, if they are linked with the Aadhaar. Yeah. Yes. So that, that, will be, that is one of the problems we face. The stricter KYCs will, will help the, uh, the issue to be resolved the way you, you have raised the query. But as of now, I feel that yes, there are still loopholes and these people are exploiting those loopholes. It's not, uh, well, I mean, it's the final stage question for which I'm still very curious. Something happened to me beginning of the year, at the beginning of January. And since then, all the steps that you have mentioned, I have come through. And finally, your crime unit got in touch with me, and I went and talked to one of the deputy directors or somebody staying in Gurgaon, you know, your unit there. And I, we had a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and I got a call from him a couple of months ago saying that they have actually zeroed in on two accounts, and they have been able to identify people at the end of it, and that they are in the process of filing, um, com uh, what do you call it, uh, a against a court. Um, charge sheet. Cha no, more than charge sheet. It is like a case against these two people into uh, holding a hearing. Now, if this is the level of regulatory you know, tightness that we have to reaching there, what, what is the regulatory tightness that a legal system has 
when this chart sheet actually gets, uh, I mean, it's a curiosity because I'm no longer involved in it. He told me, you don't need to come there to give any witness or anything like that, that this is under our control. I just wanted to inform you and I wanted to verify that the statements that you have given are valid or not. So, so basically, once the trial starts, the evidences are weighed by the court. So now the evidences go towards the court. So no, it's no, weighed all right, but does the court even have a legal, uh, you know, like law to try someone? Yeah, yeah, why not? The law, uh, the law is in itself very powerful. No doubt they, they divide. There's a cyber law. We don't, I don't no, there, basically, that's why I said there is nothing cyber. We, we think we need cyber laws for everything. But the, there is a law of cheating. You, if in case you are cheat, cheated of your money, so it comes under IPC. If you are cheated... You, uh, you <laughs> that's one one area where we also have uh, raised this issue with the uh, with I4C MHA that we should be having a system of the immediate redressal of the money money issue because our investigation can lead to the person can uh, we can arrest a person but whether you get your money back or not cannot be guaranteed by us that is one one area which I'll upfront be very uh, straight that. If that money is out of the financial system, used, misused, or circulated somewhere, that trail, developing that trail after one year, it becomes a literally very tough. That's why we want that NPCI should on, be on board with us, so that we need not get, uh, we should not ask for details and details again and again. So system should be such that in one click we should get the access to everything in one go. So that's where uh, how the system is evolving. The fraudsters are making the new systems to siphon off the money, and the Units and the organization sit together to to find the solutions for it. It still doesn't tell you what would be a, you know, what punishment can you give those two people having identified. Look, in case the evidences are there, they can be they can be punished for se till seven years because in case you, your money has gone, so so seven years is the upper limit of this imprisonment, imprisonment yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I, I have a question with Malhotra, sir. That uh, you have said th earlier that uh, we are bl going to block the numbers which are uh, there in list of that uh, the whitelisted number instead of the whitelisted number. We will have the whitelisted number and we will block the, uh, the numbers which are not authenticated. Yes, yes. So can't we have a measures to so that the, the blacklisted number or the other numbers which are being uploaded there so they can't be uploaded or if they are up before uploading that uh, blacklisted number or the numbers which are not authenticated we have a authentication process and after that we will do that is that, the government that basically could is done insist by the google. google 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 has their own ways and means of doing business they they are doing it from the principle of economy that they they know that somebody is placing the ad they they will not lose their ad money now we we'll, we can uh, through RBI we can try, but uh, I, that's too much of asking uh, at this stage. Uh, but the way we have devised is that in case the other systems they might be saying that they are posting the messages, they are posting these uh, advertisement in the they ha they're in the economic systems. But we should be in a position to detect it once there is a clear guidelines that okay they can't post such message. Now how will Google try to limit it? What, what will be their algorithm that in case SBI and uh, they need to make their database as well. Yeah. That what all cannot be done. Yeah. What all cannot be done, what all can be done. So that might take time, but yes, step from our side will be a step in the right direction that can lead to what you are contemplating. And the second question is from Das sir, that uh, you have told that the customer, stupid customers are uh, downloading the app instead of these regulations we are uh, uh, giving and uh, that the, nowadays we can see that uh, rickshaw wala and uh, auto wala and uh, sabji wala are also using mobiles and the upi payment the, i think they are illiterate and we should go for the lit for to make them literate and uh, ma to aware them so what measures government is taking to do that it's a very valid question uh, the recommendation which has been given to the government of India uh, from this digital lending which you mentioned is that uh, an institution named Digita will be established. 
they will be verifying all the apps that will be loaded in the say google store or play store or something and somebody who doesn't have that stamp of digita that quality that cannot be loaded so this has to be carried out by the government so this is the medium term goal so that wrong or malicious kind of apps are not given to gullible people but having said that people people who are using credit card you know they give all their details payments to a third party who is not authorized to make payment on their behalf how do they do it yes they share all the data you give all your financial system to an entity who is regulated by neither sebi nor rbi by anyone and after something happens you try to say that uh, we are not protected so for protection everybody is working but uh, i don't know what is the was saying but first things should come self protection yeah. so which is missing thank you thank you sir. hello uh so uh, i'm aryan i'm from informis media uh this question is actually for both the regulators uh in the sense that you know considering we have highlighted you know how the digital space is ever expanding and the threats are ever expanding how confident are you in catching up and devising laws or guidelines regulations that protect investor interests in time you know for uh, for for these uh, for it to catch up with newer and newer methods of you know perhaps of of uh, siphoning of data or of harming an investor it's for both the regulators so sebi and rbi i think it's a very good question and uh, that is what bothers us all the time let me <laughs> tell you and uh, you must have seen that recently for you know algorithmic trading and there are a lot of algo uh, you know apps and they promise as if uh, you know someone will make money in no time first i'll request all of you that please you are all the students of economics and you understand the subjects you know money is not that simple that with the help of all these apps or things you can make it please please uh, remove these notions from your mind money is either you know properly and or you get it through proper investment so please that is the first thing now coming to your point but in our system we always have the people you know who will be uh, ahead so like recently we came with the uh, guidelines about the algorithmic apps which are in the market and we have put to the exchanges that unless this app is tested by you as per the sebi norms or the guidelines uh, no brokers can use it ultimately how the person will buy or sell the shares through one of the brokers only so that's the first thing that you make sure that you have gone through these apps uh, with the respective guidelines then you can go ahead sebi has also come with a very detailed circular and uh, how the data of customers should be protected so if you see our circular on cyber security and uh, it keeps on uh, uh, you know uh, revising and uh, uh, we have a very high power committee comprising of uh, uh, director general sartin or director general of ncipc with the best brain in the country i say those who understand this subject well and based on that we keep on revising our guidelines so i can tell you we are very very sensitive to the personal data of indians uh, you know uh, while we were celebrating yesterday that there are 10 crores dmat accounts today so it's a really matter of pride that india is moving towards uh, you know uh, investment culture and i think in last 2 3 years it has become 5 to 10 crores so it means what we did in uh, uh, 25 years uh, you know our digitization did it in 2 years and let us accept it with the rbi's efforts and uh, making the payment system so uh, you know quick simple fast uh, you know uh, you can actually uh, i'll celebrate that if a rickshaw wala uses the app and you can pay it it's good but i agree with you that it makes our responsibility much more than what you anybody can imagine that uh, this data this system is protected and people have faith in it and uh, we are trying our best and uh, that much i can tell you this is uh, the number one priority of uh, uh, sebi just on my part i would say if a simple answer has to be given we have to have a data protection data privacy law that will be the umbrella solution to this 
Uh, second thing, if you want to approach through the regulators, regulators have access only to the regulated entities that they're regulating. So through them, I spoke about the transmission mechanism, so success rate will be only that much. So if you want a very kind of comprehensive solution, it is from the government statute, the data protection law, which uh, now being discussed, uh, thing, that will be the final solution. And if there is any deviation, law enforcement agencies will have the right handle to deal with this. Hello, my name is Iman Shugotam. So uh, you were saying that uh, uh, you are running the awareness program on the DD channel. So don't you think that it is a old, to, old school practice that you are running awareness program on the DD? I don't think that many of us are watching the DD nowadays. Radio, was, radio, radio. Sir, radio, sir, no, The idea is that educated people like you don't need to be educated so much on this. The idea of Doordarshan and all is to protect those in the hinterland, in the countryside, who perhaps are not so... In, I, you people are expected to be aware of all this. Yeah. So that but which channel you will prefer? Tell me. <laughs> so there are many, there are many ways. Social media? Social media definitely. Uh, see this, uh, uh, let me reply to your question and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and let me be very honest uh, with you that uh, I don't know, can you tell me what sites you surf today? Or and what messages you saw? Let us be honest about it. And number so sometimes what happens is social media, I don't know whether, because recently we did this study and yesterday only we were uh, in our investor, edu pro uh, this, uh, we call it IPA, Investor Protection and Education Committee. And we were discussing exactly the same thing. Of course, we say we will also come with a lot of social media messages and all we will celebrate. But the people giving attention to it or believing in those messages is not that much. So the moment you see something on TV, something on news, newspaper, most authentic, because then you really see someone has put it in the newspaper with authority, because you 99% time we don't check from where this message has come. Yeah. Sometimes we just open this message, even this message may be malicious, it may have something, you know, which is totally against your interest. So, you know, it's a very uh, tough thing to do. Even if we come on social media, we come with large number of messages, whether it will get that kind of attention or seriousness. But the moment it comes on TV or on uh, uh, newspaper, the, uh, this is the study we did, the authenticity and people's respect or people's belief is much more. So that is, uh, that is the reason. But definitely you have made a good point. We know that youngsters don't, uh, you know, uh, they have their own ways of communication and uh, uh, We'll definitely, uh, you know, working on it, at least I can see, say, from SEBI side. Any more questions from the audience? There's a hand over there. I see a hand over there. Yeah. Just there. Just there. Uh, good evening. Uh, actually, my question to all, that everyone is complaining about Indian education system, but still there is no proper education related to online etiquette. What do you think, uh, how many years it will take? Yeah, I think that is something that perhaps SEBI and RBI perhaps as also the government could work on. What do you agree? In fact, uh, you know, uh, let me be honest with you that uh, some of the educations uh, we are so good at because they, those things, etiquettes were taught by our parents. So, you know, those things we can never see. So they are the first teacher, our mothers and fathers. And today we have so much of consciousness about environment, I'll say one topic, because we took all collectively that we should do it. Maybe in future it's a very good, uh, there is a new education policy and let me tell you the national curriculum framework is underway. Some of you should, whatever you feel should be taught to new generation, like you made a very good time, you, call, you can call it that, uh, you know, awareness about how you uh, behave on, uh, uh, you know, on a digital channels or whatever. Uh, this, uh, you feel those should be actually uh, highlighted to the, uh, you know, new uh, committee which is working, what should be taught in future. So these are good suggestions you are making. Okay. Thank you. I will just add here, uh, this financial literacy plus digital education is part of curriculum of high schools in 17 states which has been introduced by RBI and it will be covering all the NCRT as well. So it is already uh, in the flow. 
I just wanted one question, Mr. Gar, to ask you that how is it that in the case of banks, you very often hear that somebody's entire bank account savings were skimmed off. But DMAT accounts, I've never heard of DMAT accounts being skimmed off. What is the magic that you do with DMAT accounts, which makes it so much more difficult for uh, some investor to lose the balances in his DMAT account? Is there any reason why DMAT accounts don't get skimmed? Uh, I think one thing is that uh, very, very uh, strict uh, KYC. And, uh, you know, uh, and second, I'll say the uh, system which depositives uh, have put in place are very, very... Uh, in what way are they different from banks? Uh, I would no honestly not be able to answer your question, but it's a very good question. And uh, in fact, let me also tell you that uh, luckily we are not getting so much of complaints about, uh, you know, uh, uh, this kind of where, you know, uh, only complaints we get is that uh, if some brokers default, then if your money is pending with the broker, then there are the issues. So Sebi has said that every month you have to settle your account. Either you refund the money or, you know, give the security to your clients. You can't keep money for one month or maximum period is now three months. And if there anything happens, then we have an investor protection fund and other measures. So finally, it is you people with your own, uh, you know, uh, due diligence, you all have to be, you know, careful, uh, uh, about your own, uh, you know, how best you are uh, careful on the uh, digital, digital side. That will actually uh, matter a lot. This is my uh, suggestion to all of you. Uh, but this is a good question you asked me. It occurred to me while I was sitting here that why is it that we hear so often of bank accounts being skimmed but not of DMAT accounts? Mr. Dash, do you have any idea? No, I don't have an answer, but I can say if the thief comes, you'd rather take cash and gold rather than the refrigerator. <laughs> you wouldn't want uh, Reliance Scrup rather than 20, 30 rupees. <laughs> Any so more questions? I, I'll just uh, give an input yes. on it. Yes, sorry. So, uh, in 2014, there was a share pro scam wherein uh, the RTA officials and the company, not all, few of them, they came together and they had something called proxy claimants. Uh -huh. Proxy claimant because the RTA does the verification of okay. the signatures and the companies uh, has got the, the uh, details of the register of members of the owners of the okay. folio. So a uh, few of the companies, these people, they got together, they said key that nobody is claiming it, the dividend was not being claimed. Okay. So generally what happens is uh, when the, the dividend uh, is being released, it goes to it, bounce back. Now if it is bouncing back again and again, so that means an indication that, okay, this is a big volume of folio okay. and however it is coming back, that means nobody is claiming it, there is a mismatch of address or something. So that triggered to these people and they came up with the share pro scam wherein they had proxy claimant, or say a person of 23 years of age, signatures verified and they gave it and when the original person came, they said that, sorry sir, it has already been given and it has been sold in the open market. Okay. So this was happening in then 2014. Now when we as an authority came into being, uh, though it was 2013 Act which gave us the power earlier, it was not coming to Government of India. Mm -hmm. Now we became the custodian. So we are like a bank to the common man, the fractional owners of their folios. Okay. We are the custodian of their shares. We are the custodian of their money. It stays with us. However, the process of approval is there wherein the claimant claims that, okay, I am ha having this 100 shares. So, so the thing is, seven years after seven years, if you do not take dividend, it comes to us because in Evidence Act also, sure, yeah. seven years has got a relevance. So when it comes to it, it becomes property of uh, government of India as a custodian. Now, in, what you asked is why it is not going is because when it comes to us, we go through a process of approvals wherein we have to do the KYC and the company has to ratify the claimant's claim, then only we release it from our demand account okay. to the individual. Otherwise. Uh, in normal cases, ma'am, what happens is generally the de it stays in the demand account of the individuals. If it has to move out, there has to be a trigger. And the trigger could be through a broker or through a person or a, a person who is a shareholder who is giving away his, all his information to that broker or the middleman to carry out, the, execute. The, so th there is a system in place wherein the folios, they don't move out just like that. But yes, the major chunk which comes to us which we are holding of the unclaimed, we do not release it just like that. Okay. So we have got checks and balances okay. in our place. That's why we are very, very, and still I'll, you'll be surprised, we have counter claimants. People with identical documents, same name, 
with different photographs coming for asking for the same shares. So we have got incidents in place wherein people have come to us with uh, counter claimants also. So okay. in India, so you can get a stamp. No, yeah, no end to human ingenuity yeah. for all kinds of things. But any more questions? We're almost at the end of time. Rithul, I think it's four o'clock that you want. You wanted to walk, wind up at four. Yeah, so we just take a last time. question. So yeah, please. The last uh, question. Uh, Jain sir ki question ka you karna chahta ho, unhone puchha tha ki uh, jo account jo fraud hota hai kisi ke saath, to wo account freeze kyun nahi kiya jata? Immediately account ko freeze karna chahiye. Aur agar aap cyber cell mein bhi agar aap complaint karte hain, to wahan se bhi aapko reply seedha ye mil jata hai ki uh, aapne hi OTP diya hai, aapne share kiya, to it's your fault. Matlab wo usme koi help nahi karte cyber cell se koi aapko help nahi mil milti. Par hona ye chahiye ki uska account jis ke paas gaya hai agar fraud koi hai. So, their account should immediately freeze and if it has been a fraud, if it has been unknowingly, then it has been a fraud. Yeah. The correct figure, last year we have frozen the account worth 6.5 crores. So, it depends on whether you call at a time when the account can be freezed. It was called on time. So, but still… Whom did you call? Basically, you have this particular facility is only with 1930. If you call a local police officer, he'll take a lot of time to get that account f frozen. So that is where the difference can be. Yes, there has to be ease of doing complaints as well. And you might be complaining to anybody, there has to be. That's why we have now connected 1930-112. The one responsible, why, why should, a, uh, should a citizen remember 10, num 10 numbers? So only one number should be the Indian Online mark. complaint we gave. The online complaint we gave. Uh, online, it definitely, if I have to say that we, in Delhi police, we receive around 80,000, 90,000 complaints my unit receive I, per year. So openly accepting, yes, the resources and the the number of complaints coming in, it might go on, go on a little bit on the wait side. But now club uh, connecting 112 and 1930, they, that's a step in the right direction. Now nobody needs to remember 1930, just need to call 112 and they will connect to the 1930, that is the citizen uh, financial fraud helpline. Second question is that our apps are like apps on Paytm, phone pay, so if there are apps on the official app, it will be better that there will be a chance to be less than a chance to be fraud. There is a cred, like a cred, like a cred, like a phone pay, Paytm, so there are apps on the official app, which will be official, which will be official, which will be official. It's a platform problem because everybody wants everything in a platform. This is the normal tendency of the consumer. But every bank has their own app. And from the statistics, I will tell you the UPI fraud, which is the highest number of frauds in digital space. If you again dissect them, the frauds happening on third party apps is much higher and recovery therefrom is low. This is what the statistics says. But for different reasons, as I said, platform is a uh, kind of uh, preference of the consumer. Uh, but every bank has their own app for UPI. Uh, any more questions? I think we're going to wrap. Uh, that's okay. I just uh, see two hands with this, we'll stop. Okay. Hello, everyone. So uh, a few days back, we get a news about uh, uh, from the RBI that. Uh, uh, it takes a survey from uh, it takes feedback from their stakeholder about charging uh, try charge on a UPI transaction. So can you put some light on it or the decision of of that feedback? Shall we take the second question also? And maybe it, if there's some overlap, it will save time. Yeah, you had a question, right? So I have a question for a share market. The delist company uh, this stock market. Uh, the share has been not accredited uh, in st uh, investors also. What can do for can, that? Okay, so two separate questions, delisting and I think Mr. Dash, you can go ahead with your UPI charges. UPI charges, RBI has come out with a discussion paper because so far there is no charge on the UPI. But UPI people who are providing, because it requires infrastructure and they have been demanding, like earlier, MDR was there. Uh, merchant discount rate for um, uh, uh, debit cards, it was removed or reduced. So RBI is uh, kind of controlling it. But in the long term, because UPI is picking us so much, whether it can be a free service or it has to be chargeable service, that is the discussion paper which RBI has put it in the website. And about a specific question, somebody had approached us. I have no clear idea, so I would not rather comment on that. But this process is on. 
Yeah, coming to the delisting, uh, actually delisting doesn't come under SEBI. Once a company is SEBI, actually regulated uh, entities are listed entity companies, not the delisted. Once they are delisted, the Syntax, whole process is Syntax followed. Company, and thereafter, it, is, uh, it comes to, you know, MCA, which becomes the, you know, authority to take up if there is any issue. Yeah. I think we'll end with this. Any quick comments from any of the panelists, and then we'll wrap up. Nudul, you have something no, to say? No, no, I just wanted to thank you before you end the <laughs> no, panel. No, no. So, <laughs> thank you, everybody. I'm glad you had such large turnout of students, and thank you very much to the panelists also. I think it was a very interesting discussion. At least I enjoyed it. I don't know about everybody else. So, I hope thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining this panel at a short notice. Uh, Mr. Sumit would just say the last, last word for him. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And it is a great pleasure to extend a very formal vote of thanks on behalf of uh, Investor Education and Protection Fund Authority. Uh, uh, on this momentous occasion of the sixth, sixth foundation uh, day of IPFA. Uh, uh, I would like to put on record the vision of our uh, uh, CEO, Srimati Anita Shah Akila, uh, in conceptualizing this program. A special uh, credit goes to Dr. Mridul Sagar, sir, uh, IPF research chair at NCER, and uh, Dr. Anil Kumar Sharma, secretary NCER. Uh, and the team for the conduct, a uh, wonderful organization and conduct uh, today for this, of this event. On behalf of uh, CEO IPFA uh, Authority, I would like to ex extend heartfelt gratitude to our extinguished uh, panelist, uh, Sri Jayant Kumar Dash, uh, Executive Director RBI, uh, Sri uh, GP Garg, Executive Director SEBI, and member of IPFA. Uh, Sri Rakesh Jain, uh, member of IPFA, uh, Mr. KPS Malhotra, DCP Intelligence, uh, Fusion uh, and Strategic Operations, uh, Cybercrime, Delhi Police. And uh, thank you, Mithili ma'am, for wonderfully moderating this uh, seminar today, sir. Uh, I believe that the deliberations held during the day would have uh, proved very useful and would help in developing and inculcating financial skills uh, in each one of us and make us uh, adapt in informed financial, uh, to take informed financial decisions. A special applause is deserved by the wonderful audience here for being receptive and participative in the discussions held today. A big round of applause for them. And at last, uh, I would like to place on record the appreciation for uh, Team IPFA for coordinating this event and a very good evening to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, there is high tea uh, arranged adjacently. Please come for the tea. <laughs>